Senate Judiciary Committee will come back to order. Apologize for the delay. Uh, some of us were double, uh, double shifting over at uh, Commerce Committee. Um, all right. Um, we're going to take up Senate File 3530. Senator Gustafson, come on forward. Uh, members, the uh, bill has been distributed to you, along with the fiscal note of zero and some uh, uh, letters in connection with it. Senator Gustafson, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before you is Bill SF3530, which prohibits the possession, sale, or manufacturing of cell phone cases that look like firearms. A quick internet search of cell phone cases shows how realistic these phone cases are to uh, handguns. Our public safety officers have had to make fast decisions, and this isn't safe for anyone. Furthermore, if you remove the phone from the case, you provide a very realistic looking prop that can present several dangerous scenarios. These cases are not real firearms. Prohibiting them has nothing to do with Second Amendment rights. And as Senator Latz, who used to carry this bill in 2016, said when he first brought it forward, someday some kid is going to hold up a cell phone case and somebody is going to die. Um, on a related note, this bill did pass the Senate in 2016, 60 to 0. Um, happy, we do not have any testifiers or amendments, but um, happy to take questions if that's okay with you, Sen uh, Chair Latz. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Uh, anyone in the room wish to testify in connection with this bill? Not seeing any. Any discussion from members of the committee? Not seeing any. Senator Gustafson, what would you like us to do with the bill? Let's go to the floor from here. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, yes, I would like it to go forward, either um, included in an omnibus or to the floor, whatever is most amenable. Okay, so we'll, we'll dual track it. For sure, we'll send it to the floor, and then if we decide to add it to the omnibus, we can do that as well. So Senator Wesley moves that Senate File 3530 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. All right. <laughs> Next bill, Senate file 4312, safe storage. Senator Gustafson. You have a testifier coming forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We also have amendments. Would you like to address those now or after the opening statement? Well, this is the bill's first stop, so these would be in the nature of uh, author's amendments. First one, the A1, is a delete everything. Um, and it looks like there's an A5 drafted to the A1. Okay, so Senator Umuva Baton, would you be willing to offer the A1 and incorporate the A5 into it? Yes, Mr. Chair, so moved. All right, Senator uh, Umuva Baton uh, moves adoption of the uh, A1 as amended by the A5. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendments are adopted. Senator Gustafson, tell us about your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members to the committee. Today, I have the privilege to present SF4312. It's a bill that will codify into law standards for the safe storage of firearms. I have an author's amendment to present that we just passed. The A1 amendment is a delete everything amendment that I have spent many months in discussions and negotiations with law enforcement, attorneys, gun owners from around Minnesota. I believe this amendment makes the bill stronger. I appreciate everyone's input. Briefly, the DE amendment accomplishes five things. It changes the name of the section and statute to safe and secure storage of firearms, adds and strengthens definitions and statute, clarifies language, the access of firearms subdivision, increases and clarifies penalties for violating statute, 
extends the limitations of applying these standards to firearms legally transported in motor vehicles, firearms used in the Minnesota State High School League events, as well as firearms being owned or possessed by law enforcement in the line of duty or are stored at a police or sheriff station. Mr. Chair, I'm hoping uh, oh, the amendment was moved. Um, the bill was drafted with one clear and safety uh, well-being of our children. Unsecured guns pose clear safety risks to our communities, particularly to our youngest. When guns are not stored safely or securely, they are accessible to unsupervised minors. The risk of death or injury significantly increases. In the home, the possibility of kids discovering and playing with firearms is far too common of an occurrence. It seems each week we hear stories of children accidentally discharging their parents' firearms while playing at home, often leading to significant harm to themselves or others. In the handouts that you have received, you will see evidence of this in Minnesota, three just in the last year. Many parents assume children are unaware of firearms in the home, but research from the Journal of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine has shown that children often know where the guns are kept and have handled them without their parents' knowledge. Members, I've had the privilege of being a teacher for most of my life. Securing and safely storing firearms has ramifications beyond the home. It impacts our classrooms as well. According to the Minnesota Department of Education, 70 handgun or long guns were confiscated in Minnesota schools during the 2021 to 2022 school year. That is more than double the highest previous total and three times the 22 guns recovered during 2018 to 2019. The bill makes sense. It is clear that safe storage practices help prevent unauthorized access to firearms and with gun violence now leading the cause of death for children 19 and under in the United States, we must do something. This single bill won't save every life, but even one tragedy can be prevented when this bill is law. Then our efforts will have been successful. You will find letters of support in your committee packet, including Children's Minnesota, Children, Minnesota Hospital Association, Minneapolis uh, Public Schools, and the Minnesota Medical Association. I have some testifiers who will speak in support of the bill as well. I also have Allison Shai, Senior Counsel for Every Town for Gun Safety, who will help answer any technical questions. The time to pass this law is long overdue, and the time for this legislation is now. I thank you, and I do look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Uh, let's go ahead uh, to listen to testifiers. Who would you like to start with, Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our first testifier, I'll let him introduce himself, was Chief Hodges from Bloomington. Chief Hodges, welcome to the Judiciary thank you, uh, Public Safety Mr. Committee. Chair, um, I have the privilege of being the Chief of Police for the City of Bloomington, which, if you don't know, is the fourth largest city in the state of Minnesota, and um, I lead a department that is not only fully staffed, we're overstaffed as a police department, so we do pretty good in Bloomington. Now, I'll get off the Bloomington kick. Uh, in general, uh, I am not supportive of additional gun legislation. Um, I think that enforcing uh, gun laws such as felon in possession or possession of firearms by those who shouldn't possess them is something that we need, really need to focus on. But there are two areas that I do think that we do need to strengthen our gun laws, one being uh, the straw purchases and the next one being a safe storage of firearms. Why is that? Uh, earlier in my career when I was a deputy in Dakota County, we'd often respond to residents that had $10,000 safes but had gotten their guns stolen out of the safes because the safes were not locked. Uh, this is an area that I do think that as gun owners, I've had owned guns for 30 years. Uh, I carry a gun every single day. Uh, we need to be responsible for locking up our guns, and that's something that I really believe that this bill does. I do believe that this bill addresses concerns that uh, we had last year with the bill, and I do think that um, if we get this passed, that we can hopefully prevent uh, some unintended consequences from kids getting access to these weapons mm -hmm. that they shouldn't. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Right. Who's your next testifier, Senator Gustafson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a survivor, Hillary Brazel. Ms. Brazel. Oh. Chief, thank you. Ms. Brazel, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. If you could go ahead and state your name for the record and present your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Hillary Brazel. 
Uh, thank you to members of the committee for hearing my testimony on Bill SF4312. Thank you specifically for Chair Latz and for Senator Gustafson for authoring this legislation and for connecting me to this important and personal topic. I'm here to share the tragic story of, my, uh, of Michael Brazel. He was my husband who was murdered in the front yard of our home at 7.30 on a Saturday morning, May 6, 2023. Michael had noticed a young man breaking into our car and went out into our front yard to confront him. Michael was instantly shot three times in his chest and back by a 17-year-old young man who was the lookout for the crime. I awoke to those three shots in a loud car driving away from our home. My 14-year-old son was, uh, did awake to this same loud car pulling up to our house, heard yelling in our front yard, and witnessed most of the scene where his father was murdered. As a pediatric nurse, I was the first responder for Michael. I tried to perform life-saving measures while my older son called 911, and my younger son watched the horror play out. Michael was attended to by the St. Paul Police Department and St. Paul Fire Department before being brought to HCMC where he was pronounced dead within 35 minutes of the shooting. My sons instantly no longer had their father, I no longer had my husband, and the ripples of his death to, by gun violence have torn apart our lives and those of our close friends, neighbors, and countless other community members. Michael was a dedicated father, family member, friend, a skilled carpenter, an artist, and a youth hockey coach. My list of concerns related to Michael's murder is long. There were four young men in the car, ages 17, 18, 19, and 22. They all had previous history with guns, violent crimes, both as juveniles and some as adults. They all had a criminal history and were on probation around the time of the crime. And specifically, the shooter had just been released from probation in April of 2023 from a previous crime of holding up another student at gunpoint in a high school bathroom just to try and steal a cell phone. The shooter was also paid, pulled over on May 2nd, 2023, just four days prior to my husband's death in the South Metro, but nothing came of this traffic stop. These same four young men went out car shopping, looking for things to steal, starting on the night of Friday, May 5th, 2023, through the early morning of May 6th, 2023. Michael was murdered over the valuables that were in my car. It amounted to a phone charger and a bag of makeup. These young men had planned ahead to bring a gun with them while they went car shopping for protection, and they took turns as lookouts for each other while breaking into cars. The gun they used to murder Michael was stolen from an unsecured closet that um, w was not properly stored by the gun owner. Had this gun been properly stored, I believe Michael might still be alive. Following Michael's murder, the stolen gun was kept under another driver's seat in a different vehicle by the same man who broke into my family's car. With this, I take that to believe that this gun was kept so that it could be needed or used in future crimes. St. Paul Police Department retrieved that same gun from under the driver's seat through a traffic stop a month after Michael's murder. This helped us have a strong case to convict the young men who murdered my husband. Two of them pled guilty to Michael's murder and are currently serving time, but nothing will ever replace Michael's life that was taken and all the life that we had yet to live together. It was only 57 seconds that the criminals spent at our home that morning. They drove up to my home, broke into my car, interacted with Michael, shot him three times in the chest and back, and sped away. In less than one minute's time, a 17-year-old created a lifetime of consequences, and our lives will never be the same. I urge you to support the legislation of Bill SF4312. I believe the proper storage of guns could have prevented Michael's murder and can prevent this type of tragedy from destroying other lives in the state of Minnesota in the future. Thank you. Ms. Brazel, thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, I also have on our, our testifier list uh, Gretchen Damon. Ms. Damon is here. She can come forward. 
Mr. Chair, we have, oh, I have one more testifier. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Go ahead, Senator Gustafson. Who do you have next? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have Rolf Olson. Mr. Olson, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Go ahead and state your name and present Thank your testimony. Thank you. Chairman Latz, members of the committee, my name is Rolf Olson. I'm a husband, I'm a Lutheran pastor, I'm the father of a murdered daughter. And I'm here today to share my story and voice support for SF 4312. I thank Senator Gustafson for her work on this important issue. In October 2007, our middle child, Catherine, um, went to a house in Savage to answer a Craigslist ad for a babysitter. What she encountered was not a woman needing child care. She met a 19-year-old man holding his father's pistol. It was over in less than five minutes. <clears throat> Catherine arrived with a backpack full of children's toys and books. She did part-time work as a nanny to help finance her path toward a graduate degree in Spanish. She loved kids. They loved her. This trip to Savage was nothing new, but it was her last. Catherine was brilliant, creative, risk-taking, curious, adventurous. Her dream was to put together her love of Spanish and theater for a career, but that dream ended with a bullet in her back. Well, since then, I've spoken on this issue from different angles. As a dad, I've talked about grief. As a pastor, I've talked about forgiveness. As a police chaplain for many years, I testified in these chambers about the brokenness in our communities. Now, as a gun owner and hunter myself, I'm not opposed to guns, but I certainly know how deadly they are. I know the consequences of their misuse. But I know that what we are doing now is not producing acceptable results. My daughter was murdered with an unsecured pistol kept in his father's dresser drawer. It was kept there next to a pill bottle filled with bullets. Had that pistol been properly stored, it's quite likely that my daughter would still be alive. So I'm glad to see that SF 4312 includes legal consequences for failure to secure a firearm. Lives will be saved by proper storage. Now there's nothing in this law that hinders ownership and safe use of a firearm. That's the goal that every true sportsman supports. My story is just one example of how unsafe storage can have tragic consequences. So I trust that you will use Minnesota wisdom to help stop the carnage that is plaguing our country and our state. Thank you, Senator Gustafson, for carrying this legislation. Thank you to the committee for the work you are doing and for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Olson, for sharing your personal story with us. Senator Gustafson, do you have any other testifiers you'd like to call forward? No, Mr. Chair, I do not. Thank you. All right. um, so we do have a list of people that had <coughs> signed up ahead of time to testify. Um, uh, Rob Vanasek from Everytown. Do you hear? Come on forward. He's at a, a friend's funeral, so he's unable to testify. Okay. He's uh, not available. Uh, Timberland Mosaicus. I say that properly? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> I get that a lot. Yes. Okay, from uh, Students Demand Action at the University of Minnesota. Go ahead and state your full name, pronouncing your last name the way I should say it, and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Latz, committee members, and staff. My name is Timberlyn Majakis. I am a junior at the University of Minnesota and founder and leader of Students Demand Action at the U. I am originally from Michigan and attended Michigan State for my first two years of college. I am testifying today in support of SF 4312, strengthening requirements for secure storage of firearms and ammunition. 
On February 13th of 2023, my life was irreparably changed after a man entered Michigan State University and shot eight of my classmates, killing three of them. After receiving an email to run, hide, fight, I sat barricaded in an on-campus gym only one block from the shooting. For hours, I listened to police scanners, texted my family and friends to tell them I loved them, and saw my life flash before my eyes more times than I can count. When the door to the gym suddenly opened, people began to scream and run for their lives. I thought I was going to die. I am here today, a little over one year later, still unable to shake that feeling of certain death. The trauma caused by gun violence is one I share with thousands across my state of Michigan, Minnesota, and nationwide. In Minnesota, an average of 43 children and teens die by guns every year, 49% of which are suicides. Secure storage of firearms and ammunition can save hundreds of young lives while preventing youth suicide, accidental shootings, and school shootings. It is time for Minnesota to act before another young life is lost at the hands of preventable gun violence. I encourage members of this committee to vote yes on SF 4312. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Mazakis. I have Barbara Nye. Is she not here? Okay. Uh, then we will go to uh, these are all done. Oh, she's online. Okay. Uh, uh, Nephi Cole from the National Shooting Sports Foundation, I believe, is online. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I assume you can hear me okay? Yes, go right ahead. Just go ahead and state your name first, if you would. My name is Nephi Cole. That's N-E-P-H-I-C-O-L-E. -E. I'm the Director of Government Relations and State Affairs for the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is the Firearms Trade Association of America. As you know, we have a number of great programs, um, such as Operation Child Safe, Secure Store, and others. And we represent the 9,000 retailers, manufacturers, and distributors of firearms in the United States of America. We have some concerns about this bill and not questioning the good intentions because we all believe that you know, one death uh, from a firearm is too many. But there are some applicational errors and, and holes in this bill that I wanted to bring attention to. The bill has some technological pro some, some technolo some technical problems and with such a high penalty on this bill, we think that that misses the mark and it's bad policy. So first, the definition of firearm centers around a device designed to be used as a weapon in the bill, but it doesn't deal with the full life cycle of firearms. It talks about permanently inoperable, but doesn't deal with the time frame before that, specifically components and build parts. As soon as a receiver is, is serialized, it becomes a firearm. So a serialized receiver with no barrel or bolt is by federal definition a firearm, so is a suppressor, and they're benign unless assembled with other components. This bill also, this proposal also fails to recognize that firearms can be temporarily rendered inoperable mid-life cycle. And that's in more ways than simply using a lock, remover of a bolt, splitting a receiver set, removing firing pins. These are all things that render any firearm inoperable. At SHOT Show, the largest event of its kind in the world, the one that we run, nothing can go bang, but there are no locks on the floor. Other internals are altered or temporarily removed. Exemptions should be broader than just the locks that are, that are in this proposal. A firearm that is rendered safe should be your standard. We have some other concerns about authorized users as, as defined here, but that doesn't seem to, th this bill doesn't seem to create a carve out for authorized users such as youth hunters. We notice there's a carve out for folks who are participating in youth target shooting sports but in Minnesota, at age 14 to 18, you can hunt unaccompanied by an adult. That indicates that you'd be legally in possession of a firearm out of the arm's reach of the firearm's owner. What about smart guns? Not all smart guns are biometric. This proposal feels like it was prepared with a limited view on and limited technical expertise on firearms use and storage issues. We don't think it's ready. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Cole. 
Our next testifier um, is uh, Rob Dorr from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Mr. Dorr, come on forward. Welcome to the committee. If you go ahead and identify yourself and present your testimony. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Rob Dorr. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Uh, we, uh, I do recognize that this bill is uh, significantly different than the one that was introduced last year, and there's uh, been some changes that have made since it, uh, the, it was introduced in the other body. Uh, that being said, we're still opposed due to some uh, other issues that still remain in the bill. Uh, first off, I think it's important to realize that Right now, under current Minnesota law, loaded firearms, you cannot have those around children. There's the, you can't store a firearm where you can reasonably anticipate that a, a child may access it. Um, this bill goes beyond that and creates a strict liability for all firearm storage, regardless if any, there's any children in the home or if there's any uh, pr uh, unauthorized people in the home or who will ever be in the home. Uh, this treats a farmer who lives by himself in Rozo who keeps a firearm available to defend his, uh, you know, his livestock from predators, the same as a daycare operator in Edina. And that one size fits all solution doesn't recognize the realities of how different uh, people live their lives in the state. Uh, this is also a dramatic shift in that firearms culture, and what's a little concerning to us is there's no education component. So right now, we're, we're criminalizing a benign, peaceful behavior uh, with a criminal charge uh, without really people being able to be aware or understand that the, this, this law has uh, been passed. Uh, going to the bill language, I share the concerns uh, with on line 1.9 of the author's amendment, the uh, permanent and operable. There's many ways and many reasons that a firearm may be rendered inoperable, such for cleaning, for maintenance, for repair, or for construction, uh, all lawfully, but is completely in incapable of being fired. Uh, on line 1.14, there it lists tamper-proof container without actually defining what a tamper-proof container is. Um, is is a, a safe that somebody buys an economical safe that has a lock uh, combination or a biometric from Walmart? Is that tamper-proof? What classifies it? And it's, it differs from the language used on line 1.17 of tamper-resistant, uh, which also isn't defined. But now we have different standards of, of uh, tamper listed there. Uh, going to line uh, 2.1 and 2.2, uh, it says under the direct physical control or reach of the person. This poses a problem, again, you know, if let's say you're at shooting in your backyard, uh, plenty of areas in the state, people are allowed to shoot lawfully on their own property. Um, it's unsafe to bring the firearm down range with you while you're putting up new targets. This would, put, it, it would be a unloaded, safe firearm could be left on a table while somebody goes to change out a target and be in violation of this law. And, and uh, there is a, an exception for shooting ranges on line 2.24, but that doesn't encompass private or uh, even public lands where you can lawfully target shoot, uh, even if no children or unauthorized people are in the vicinity. Um, and, and finally, I think, you know, the, the idea of a gross or of a misdemeanor crime for just behavior that's already perfectly lawful right now is of concern. Uh, our members that, our members, you know, if they're paying attention may be informed without this education component, but I'm also thinking of uh, some of the indigent clients that I've represented that are under supervised release or they're under probation terms that they already have a reduced expectation of privacy uh, by the terms of their release. Now they may be ending up with probation violations and additional charges uh, for a firearm that's in the home that may not even be theirs. Uh, you know, there's, there's really no way to track who's the owner or the possessor of that firearm. So uh, while I appreciate the work that's been done on this bill, I think it needs uh, quite a bit more work in order to be ready for prime time. Thank you, Mr. Doerr. Also, we have uh, Brian Gosh, who signed up. Mr. Gosh, come on forward. Good afternoon, Senator Latz, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you for letting me testify today. I really appreciate it. My name is Brian Gosh. I'm a lawyer and registered lobbyist with the National Rifle Association. I'm going to not duplicate any testimony. I'm sure you'd appreciate that. And, but I would like to point out a couple of things also that um, this only singles out firearms. It doesn't 
seek to secure any other type of objects that could be considered dangerous or be used to hurt oneself or other people. So it doesn't seek to secure knives, um, explosives, um, rope, vehicles, all things that have been used to hurt people or themselves or others. Um, many factors go into how individuals safely store their firearms. Um, and because of the variant um, ways in which people do that, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach that's going to work. Um, and this type of um, law would essentially, it removes the negligence part under current Minnesota law that's required before one could be charged with a crime. So currently in Minnesota, we have a safe storage requirement. Um, it requires negligence. This removes that. You can see that in the amendment. It strikes the word negligent. And it becomes more of a strict liability of if you simply don't store it this way, you are going to be liable for the misdemeanor. And then if it gets in the control of a child or a prohibited person, then you become a felon. If it gets used in the commission of a crime, you become a, a felon with a greater penalty. And so um, you're, you're, you're going after um, the innocent in this case. So you have a guilty party who broke the law, got control of a firearm they're not supposed to, and they use it in a commission of a crime or just simply get possession of it, and now you're punishing the individual who simply owned the firearm but didn't store it the way that this bill proposes. Um, I think the Bloomington police chief had it right. Um, the focus really should be on enforcing existing laws, and there's a lot of existing laws in the books in Minnesota now um, that should be enforced and make this proposal unnecessary. Um, and I, before I get into those, uh, I will say that the surrounding states of, of Minnesota do not have a law like this. The, the country does not have a law like this. This would be a, this would be a one of a kind. Uh, but if you do look at the surrounding states, um, in Wisconsin, um, it does not have a safe storage requirement. Um, but it does say that um, it has a reckless standard that it gets applied. And only to minors under 14 who get the firearm without permission and exhibit it in an unlawful way or cause bodily harm. Iowa uh, makes it unlawful to allow access to an unsecured loaded firearm to a minor under the age of 14 without permission of the parent, and such minor exhibits the firearm in a public place in an unlawful manner. South Dakota and North Dakota have no safe storage requirement. Current law in Minnesota, Minnesota Statute 609.378, Subdivision 1C, provides that a person who intentionally or recklessly, so that's similar to the Wisconsin law, causes a child under the 14 years of age, also similar to Wisconsin and Iowa, to be placed in a situation likely to substantially harm the child's physical health or cause the child's death as a result of the child's access to a loaded firearm is guilty of, of child endangerment, and may be sentenced to imprisonment for not more than 364 days or to a payment of a fine of not more than 3,000 or both. If that endangerment results in substantial harm to the child's physical health, they can be sentenced to not more than five years or a payment of not more than $10,000 or both. Also, current law in Minnesota, um, 624.713 subdivision 1.1, Minors are already prohibited from possessing a pistol, ammunition, or semi-automatic military-style assault weapon or any firearm if such minor had committed a crime of violence. Um, pursuant to Minnesota Statute 609.66, Subdivision 1B, it's a felony for a person to furnish firearms or ammunition in a municipality to a minor without the consent of the parent, guardian, or local police. Similar provisions um, already exist in federal law under 18 U.S.C. section 922X2, uh, which prohibits the possession um, or otherwise transfer of a firearm um, to children under or to people under age of 18. Um, also, in Minnesota Statute 609.666, uh, Subdivision 2. A person is guilty of a gross misdemeanor who negligently stores or leaves a firearm in a location where a person knows or reasonably knows or should know that a child is likely to gain access. That's current law. That's the statute that they're seeking to amend. Also under Minnesota Statute 624.7162 Subdivision 2, notice is required at each business location where firearms are sold by a farm, firearms dealer in a conspicuous location with the following language that is unlawful to store or leave a loaded firearm where a child can obtain access. These are all current laws. Um, 
the last statute of reference for minors is uh, 260B.425, subdivision 1A, which says any person by act, word, or omission who encourages, causes, or contributes to the delinquency of a child or to a child's status as a juvenile pet is guilty of a, of a, of a gross misdemeanor. Um, the, uh, the felony level in this amendment um, also applies if a prohibited person gets possession of that firearm. And federal law already prohibits a prohibited person from possessing a firearm. That's found at 18 U.S.C. section 922G and 922D. So given the diversity of state and federal laws already on the books, you don't need this amendment. You don't need this bill. Also, um, there's already a lot of exceptions included in this bill, and I think anytime you have a lot of exceptions, it tends to show you might be starting in the wrong place. Um, but also, noticeably absent from the exceptions are um, when a child obtains the firearm as a result of an illegal entry uh, by any person. Um, that was stricken with the amendment. Um, here's another important one. When the child gains access to a loaded firearm and uses it in the lawful exercise of self-defense. So imagine a child's mom is being attacked by an intruder. child gets a hold of that firearm, uses it in self-defense of others and self-defense of his mother. The owner of that firearm is now a felon owner of the firearm didn't do anything wrong. The onus should be on the bad guy, the intruder who's attacking his mother. Yeah. That exception's not included in this bill. There's not an exception for when a person stores or leaves a loaded firearm, uh, reasoning believes that a child is not likely to be present when the firearm is stored or left. And these are exceptions that you'll find in the Wisconsin law. Um, there's also noticeably absent an exception for when the child accessed the firearm and the bodily harm they caused was a result from an accident that occurred when the child used the firearm for hunting, target practice, or other lawful means. And another big and noticeably absent exception is hunting. Um, if you set your shotgun down and you're having a lunch break and you're with your group talking but you're out of reach of your firearm, that's going to be a violation. And that's just common practice in Minnesota and other places. Um, I see you want me to wrap up, and I appreciate that. I, I will say um, one last thing, if I can, just that I think I want to use this example. I used it on the House side as well, and that is if you applied the same um, logic to a vehicle, because vehicles can be used to hurt people, but it's common at times to quick run into a store, leave your vehicle running. But if this same law applied to vehicles and you left your vehicle running outside while you ran in to buy one item and a child or a prohibited person got possession of your vehicle and used it to run somebody over, you as simply as being the owner who didn't secure their vehicle is now gonna be a felon. And so, Mr. Chair, thank you for the time. Members of the committee, I'll stand by for questions. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Uh, that's all that I have who signed up ahead of time to testify. Is there anyone else in the room uh, who wanted to testify in connection with this bill? Uh, sir, come on forward. <clears throat> uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. If you could just state your name uh, for the record and then tell us what you'd like to say. Hi, I'm Stanley Renty. Um, I'm part of SDA with Timberland. I'm the Vice President. Um, and i just like to provide some dates of gun violence at the University of Minnesota um, that are most recent. I recognize that there's others at pre, uh, other colleges, but I don't go there, so I'll, I can only speak for Minnesota. Um, February 24th, 2024, um, at 10.25 p.m., shots were fired at Sanford Hall. Um, March 10th, 2024, 3.11 a.m., a victim was shot down the street from Rob Rake Hall. Um, January 11th, 2024, 7.21 a.m., there was a threat to the University of Minnesota um, of multiple people being shot. 
On September 3rd, 2023, at 11.43 p.m., there were shots fired near St. Paul Student Center. I uh, believe that's Ju July 2nd, 2023, 3.36 p.m., shots fired near the Uni University of Minnesota campus. And finally, uh, June 27th, 2023, at 1.18 a.m., uh, in Dinky Town, near the University of Minnesota, a person was pointing guns at cars that were passing by. Um, I will say, the most recent one, Sanford Hall, um, my friends, they were sleeping, and they got woken up to shots being fired near them. And me being me, um, with a little bit of military training, um, I went out to try and get to them. Of course, I was turned away. But um, it just proves to note that this needs to pass. There are students at the University of Minnesota that have guns on campus and are willing to use them for harm and also protection. There are people in the surrounding communities who are willing to come to the University of Minnesota, threaten us, and have us live in fear day by day. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Anyone else wish to testify? I see one more. Okay, I only see one more hand, so that'll be it. Sir, come on forward, and you'll be the last testifier. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ben Dorr. I am the executive director for Minnesota Gun Rights. And our membership are completely opposed to this legislation. Frankly, I've been getting a lot of emails from gun owners calling it tyrannical trash. I don't know, maybe you guys have been getting some of those too. Um, and as the bill sponsor has said, this bill won't save all the lives, so we know it's going to lead to another gun control bill, and another one, and another one, and another one. And so we're opposed to this one, we're opposed to the next one, we're opposed to the last one, and there will be a political price paid in this election cycle, next election cycle, and every election cycle that follows for the swing district voters who vote for this legislation. So I encourage this committee to vote no, and uh, to not put it on the Senate floor for a vote. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Dorr. All right, we're going to open this up for uh, discussion among members of the committee. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I begin, I wanted to bring attention to a letter from the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. Apparently, law enforcement community is divided on this particular <laughs> Invited on the support of this particular bill. Uh, at the very last paragraph, in conclusion, the Sheriff's Association does not support Senate File 4312 and urge you to reconsider its provisions in favor of more balanced and effective approaches to firearm safety. Uh, having said that, I did have some, some questions. Um, with this kind of universal application to firearm safety and, and securing a firearm, uh, it doesn't seem like there's consideration of those individuals that may require a gun for their own safety or defense in their own home. Now, Minnesota's uh, provision, even in the event that there's a threat inside the home, one kind of has a duty to retreat until the very last possible moment, but nevertheless, those moments can come at a homeowner very quickly. Um, fumbling around for a lockbox or a key or anything else, um, I, I find this bill to be rather cumbersome in the face of defending oneself <coughs> At home, to a th to, through a to a deadly threat. 
so I'm very concerned about this particular bill in that regard. I certainly am one who would promote firearm safety and securing a weapon, uh, but nevertheless, there are individuals who are who feel threatened in their home or their neighborhood, and they aren't going to sleep. They may not even sleep well if they have a gun by their side in in their own bedroom. But nevertheless, this is going to cause uh, a delay in reaction. And for the very lives that we are trying to protect through a firearm safety law like this, I believe we're going to create another issue of danger to individual citizens. So how do we uh, correct this problem, Senator Gustafson? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Um, I understand those concerns. I should have mentioned in the beginning, but um, I, we own guns in our home. Um, we have two safes. One is a quick release. One is a more formal fortified safe. Um, they're easy and quick to use when necessary, but they also provide a layer of protection. I hear a lot from people, and those are valid concerns about feeling safe in their homes and whether or not they're able to access their weapon when they need it. But as you stated, they still might feel that way even with a loaded gun next to their bed. So it's a safety issue that um, I don't know justifies not being able to lock it up. If you've been to a gun dealership recently and you've seen the level of safes that they offer in stores, you know that they offer quite a few that are made for a quick release and quick access if needed, but are also provide that protection so that somebody who we don't want to use our guns doesn't have access to them. I, I understand the need for safety. I, I, I understand that very well, but I would just say that you know, the, the split second that people are talking about, I don't know if it is um, something that should supersede what this bill is trying to do. We know that this will save lives. We know that there is a fear of people when of someone breaking in. But unless you're sleeping with, you know, all of your windows open and your door wide open, you'll still have access to that quick second it might take to use a quick release safe. So I don't know that I want to put those moments where you're able to still access your gun as quickly as you need it to, to prevent this from doing what it can do, which is to save the lives of kids and un other unauthorized users. I don't know that one right should overweigh the freedom of children to live safely in their homes. Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Mr. Chair, um, also there's another segment of our population that often requires guns uh, in their occupation. I'm talking about rural uh, farm people that are living out in rural areas. They not only have to have concerns about predation, but they also have concerns about their own domestic farm animals. Farm animals at times can be very dangerous. Uh, take, for example, a cow who just, just recently uh, had a calf. You even walk too close to a cow and it'll take, it'll take you down and trample you into dust. And um, many farmers have a readily available gun just for those emergencies. Fumbling around with a lock while a, a cow or a bull or any other animal is going after your daughter or your son you can't fumble around with a key or try and find the lockbox or put your thumb on a biometric key of some sort in your home uh, while the danger is outside. This bill puts those individuals in even more danger. So I don't think it's really hitting the mark. I believe the the bills that are now law, the balanced approach that we've created in Minnesota law, as Mr. Ghosh has uh, referenced in Minnesota law, I believe is the balance. And it gives that opportunity. And if there is an endangerment, 
uh, an irresponsible uh, handling of a firearm, uh, there are penalties, just almost exactly the same penalties as in your bill. I, I just don't understand why we have to go to this extreme and this radical in writing a bill to face the endangerment, but at the expense of limiting and curtailing the freedom of other people to defend themselves and their children and their home. Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, Senator Gustafson, I want to thank you so much for bringing this bill. And I know between last year and this year, you have done a significant amount of work that you have talked to stakeholders, you have taken input, and you have um, put forward a bill that I know in your mind is better than the one that came forward last year. Uh, and, and I think that is an, an important piece of legislation that I certainly wholeheartedly uh, support. Um, th there's nothing extreme or radical about this. There's nothing extreme or radical about the idea that when someone owns a deadly weapon that can be wielded in a matter of seconds, that that shouldn't be properly stored. And there is a problem. There is a problem with this because we know that kids are accessing this. They are shooting siblings, parents, and so on and so forth. There's nothing extreme or radical about this. And I guess one thing that I'm always curious about is the fact that, as far as I understand in this state, there's no training requirement for people to own a firearm. And I'm curious, we don't need to have this discussion now, but I'd be really curious to know if our friends from the NRA and our friends from the Gun Caucus support a training requirement. A training requirement um, prior to the purchase and ownership of a firearm. That seems like that would be a reasonable, responsible thing to do. Our kids can't wait any longer. This bill needs to pass. And if there are folks who want to keep working on this with Senator Gustafson, I have every reason to believe that she would be happy to do that and would continue to have those conversations. But what ends up happening every single time we have a conversation about guns, nobody ever wants to actually do anything about it. And so Senator Gustafson, I appreciate your work on this. Thank you so much. And I will be uh, gladly supportive of this bill. Any further discussion among members of the committee? Senator Umover Baden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also want to join in thanking you, Senator Gustafson, for all of your work on this bill. I um, want to thank all of our testifiers, but especially thank um, two of my constituents that we were able to hear from today, Rolf Olson and Hillary Brazel, who um, tragically lost loved ones and told us exactly how safe storage could have prevented that loss. Um, so I'm proud to be a co-author on the bill, and I thank you for your work. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since it's already illegal to have a loaded firearm where a child can reasonably access it, it seems to me at least the primary purpose of this or effect of this would be for those that don't have kids or maybe don't have any kids expecting to come over. So I guess why are we getting involved in the storage of somebody who doesn't have kids or doesn't have kids coming over? Is it just the remote chance that someone might break in no. to their house or, or, or is there some other reason? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Cruen, um, yeah, so we understand that even though most gun owners are doing the right thing and keeping things safe and there are, you're right, some statutes that would put some of this in protection, I think you touched on one of those things. You're talking about theft, gun theft. If, you're, if your guns aren't secure, so you might be responsible with them, you might live alone, you might know where they are at all times, but that doesn't prevent you or make you immune to theft. And as we heard our testifiers talk about, that's a real issue when people get guns that shouldn't have guns, especially when they steal them. Um, and gun theft is something that is, continues to be a problem. Also, 
many firearm own, or firearm owners are already being safe, but if you take a look just from like the National Firearm Industry Trade Association, this is what they say. As a firearms owner, you are responsible for knowing how to properly handle your firearms, how to secure your firearms in a safe manner in your home. If for any reason you feel uncomfortable with or unable to accept these responsibilities, we strongly urge you not to own a firearm. So people who own firearms and are responsible with them understand that the safe storage is necessary and their most responsible gun owners are already locking up and securing their weapons, which we appreciate. We're just sort of putting this on the books so that every Minnesotan who owns a gun in our state rises to that level. And Mr. Chair, um, um, and I don't mean to interrupt, um, after whatever order you think my testifier can also add to some of those uh, statutes that he's speaking of. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to keep in mind the time and the number of bills we still have to go through yet today. So we'll, we'll, take, uh, we'll take the necessary testimony, but maybe not any supplementals unless it's a direct question on it. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm, I'm also concerned about not having a negligence standard. It, in it seemingly the creation of a strict liability standard here. Um, somebody is acting responsibly under a reasonableness standard, um, then it, I'm uncomfortable criminalizing activity that is inherently reasonable. Sure, things that somebody can break into a house, but I think ultimately having a negligence standard would, would uh, be better than making it a strict liability, but a practical question I have here is what what happens if a firearm is stored illegally under your bill or if this bill becomes a law and let's say it's unclear who was in possession of that firearm or who was last in possession who's charged in that situation is it the last person who possessed it, the owner, the homeowner. Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, I'm going to defer to my testifier. Okay. Sure, I'm just like in any if other- If you go ahead and state your name Sorry. for the record. <laughs> Got it, my name is Allison Shee. Direct testimony through the chair, please. Okay, oh, hello. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, my name is Allison Shee, S-H-I-H. I serve as senior counsel at Every Town for Gun Safety. I'm happy to answer that question. But just like in any other criminal prosecution where the prosecutor has to have probable cause, there needs to be probable cause to arrest and you need to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt who is at fault um, and whose responsibility it was, if they don't have those facts, they would be unable to bring this kind of prosecution. But that is the kind of thing that is often sussed out in the investigation phase um, of any kind of criminal activity. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just gonna start with a comment that was alluded to earlier that there's no training requirements even for kids and I'll just let Senator know, Westland know or hopefully be happy to know that there are youth hunter certifications and programs and requirements. As a matter of fact, the Department of Natural Resources hosts courses throughout the year for kids to be able to get students ages 11 and older to be able to take classroom-based firearm safety certification, which becomes valid at age 12. The class consists of a minimum of four separate class sessions that students must attend the entire class for each one in order to get the certificate. They learn safe handling of firearms, hunter responsibility, wildlife conservation, and then students uh, also complete a field day as well where they're trained in seven uh, scenario-based training opportunities that allow students to demonstrate commonly accepted principles of safety in both hunting and handling of firearms, uh, which also includes shooting a 22 caliber rifle on a range. So there is training requirements for the DNR. Uh, I know the NRA who spoke earlier also has some pretty robust training both for youth and adults. Uh, if a person is to uh, have a permit to carry a firearm, there is a robust day-long training uh, that you must take in order to get that permit from your sheriff's department. So there is plenty of training that does take place for individuals. Uh, to the bill itself, uh, I do have one question that did come up. I, I did talk to all my sheriffs who are opposed to this bill. They, they do think that there's some ambiguity to it. <laughs> Senator Limmer did state um, some of the concerns of sheriffs throughout the state. Um, 
the question that, that came up was for a law enforcement individual. We don't see a law enforcement exemption in the bill. Um, so one of my sheriffs said, you know, if, if the question posed to me was, if I, leave my, if I leave my patrol car vehicle to get gas, my long gun is in the squad car, is that unlawful? There's no, we don't see a law enforcement exemption in here, so why is there not an exemption for law enforcement? Um, and can you speak to that? Because an officer should be able to have some more leeway, certainly, than, than, we, than the average citizen. Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, thank you, Senator Eichhorn. There is an exception for officers on duty. Can um, you most say where that is? Can you spell Senator that out Eichhorn. for us? I want, her, I want her to do it. I know. Senator Eichhorn, um, Senator Mr. Chair, Senator Eichhorn, I'm going to have to look at the particular line. Um, there is a line. Um, if you want to just give me a moment, yep. I can find it for you. Uh, members, it's line 2.25. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Chair, um, that only appears when they're on official duties. Um, again, law enforcement individuals are considerably more trained than the average citizen. And in my opinion, that duty should extend to licensed peace officers even beyond when they're on duty. I mean, they're, they're so highly trained that I think they can handle such an exemption. Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Eichhorn, um, thank you. I, I just want to clarify what you're asking. Are you saying that when they're off duty, officers should leave their loaded weapons in their squad car without supervision? I'm saying officers, should have, I'm saying officers should have an exemption. That's all I'm just saying. Officers know how to properly store and train their firearms. Again, that exemption should be for law enforcement, not, not just when they're on duty. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to, some of the issues that were raised by some of the testifiers, I thought I would just see if you have a response. It seemed like reasonable questions, but um, on line 1.9, uh, permanently, the word permanently, and we heard of, about a whole bunch of different scenarios where a firearm would be inoperable, but not necessarily permanently. So what's, what's the reason to have that uh, permanently in the bill? Senator Gustafson. Uh, Chair, uh, Senator Cruen, um, the idea is just that we, we don't really want any in op, uh, sort of ambiguity around whether or not that weapon would be able to be used. Um, I understand that inoperable versus permanently inoperable might be some, there might be some room for a change in language there. I would be happy to have further conversations with you, but um, that is, that's why it was specifically put in there is because if a weapon is permanently inoperable, then it would not be able to be used. And so there lies the exception. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To me, if it isn't able to be fired, it's benign. There's no logical reason to to have any requirements on that. Um, second question on the tamper-proof container. Um, I was wondering that too, like what assurances does a consumer, a gun owner have who's just out buying a, a gun safe at Walmart or online that it's going to comply with, with your bill? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Cruen, I understand that there are lots of different ways that people could break into a safe. And while, you know, we don't know what all of those things could be, making it tamper-proof, I think, establishes a certain line of expectation about whether or not a weapon would be able to be attained. Um, we are specifically focused on unauthorized users. And while it's not just children, it's mostly children. And if it is tamper-proof it, or tamper-resistant, um, that would, I think, that provides the level of security to keep that firearm away from them and make it inaccessible. If you're looking between the difference between tamper-proof and tamper-resistant, again, that is language that I'd be happy to work with you on. Um, but that is what we're going with now to make it very clear that we don't want children to access those weapons. Senator Crump. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate those answers. Um, I, you know, my perception, um, just generally speaking, is that all the gun owners I know are responsible, and um, it seems like this law is going to trip up a lot of responsible gun owners um, and attaches criminal liability to it, uh, you know, without a negligence standard or something, you know, reckless um, or even just negligence. 
in turning it into strict liability, I think um, there's the potential for a lot of law-abiding gun owners um, to be subject to criminal penalties. So that, that's my overall concern with this. But thank you for answering the questions. Any further discussion from members of the committee? Not seeing any. Senator Umover Baden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move that Senate file 4312 uh, as amended be recommended to pass and we refer to the Finance Committee. Senator Umover Baden moves that Senate file 4312 as amended be recommended to pass be re referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion no. Prevails. All right. Next up, members, uh, we're going to take up Senate File 733, Senator Coleman. Uh, this is being distributed, members. Uh, as Senator Coleman approaches, I just want to note uh, that this bill is technically not in front of this committee, um, but as a courtesy to Senator Coleman's interest in the topic and advocacy on behalf of this bill, uh, we wanted to get, from, and at her request, um, we wanted to give her an opportunity to present her bill in front of the committee today as we're considering gun violence uh, issues, uh, gun violence prevention issues. So, Senator Coleman, uh, we appreciate your being here and, and your patience today as we kind of move through our agenda. Uh, we welcome your input and, and uh, happy to hear what you have to say. So, Senate file number 733, Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank goodness for emergency babysitters. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Chair, Judiciary Committee members, as you know, um, we heard this bill almost exactly one year ago, and I genuinely appreciate that it earned your support. I said yesterday that this issue is personal to me, and I don't take lightly that having to return to this committee is relatively unprecedented. I do have my comments from last year, and I'm willing to repeat them, but I know you're very tight on time, as that 5 o'clock deadline is 2 hours and 17 minutes away. Uh, my bill had bipartisan support a year ago. It had bipartisan support yesterday. And no matter what happens, I believe increasing penalties on straw purchases is a good idea. I hope that a bill to increase penalties on straw purchases can move independently and with broad consensus, like the bill I have sitting in Finance Committee. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to schedule a meeting right after you're done here today to work with the House and yourself on preferred amendments and was open to accepting some yesterday on the floor yesterday and am open to accepting some in the future as well. I'd like to conclude by saying I deeply respect the members on this committee and I greatly appreciate the time. Again, if you'd like me to read my testimony from last year, I'm happy to. Otherwise, I just appreciate the brief moment here. Thank you, Senator Coleman. I appreciate uh, your being here. And, um, and I, we do know this was a bipartisan effort last year. Uh, I'm hopeful still that uh, if, if a bill such as this or similar to it passes this year, that it will also be bipartisan. And uh, your input is welcome uh, in this committee. And I know it's also welcome to the chief author um, of uh, other bills that are uh, same or similar to this. So thank you. Any questions at this time for Senator Coleman? All right. Thank you so much, Senator Coleman. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to take up uh, Senate file 5153, Senator Gustafson. Members, this will be distributed. <clears throat> Senator Gustafson, Senate File 5153 is before this committee. Uh, this is the first committee stop for this bill, and there is uh, one, two, three amendments, 
three amendments before us. So there's an A1, an A2, and an A4. Um, so let me just first just ask, because we could incorporate them into uh, one amendment. Uh, Senator Gustafson, the A1 is a delete everything. The others are drafted to the delete everything. Uh, did you intend to uh, apply A2 and the A4? Uh, Mr. Chair, just A1 and A2. Okay, so members, you can set aside the A4 amendment. Senator Pappas, would you uh, be willing to move? Uh, you could incorporate the A2 amendment into the A1 amendment, which you allowed, are allowed to do procedurally, and then move the author's amendment, the A1. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Gustafson, to your bill. Thank you, Chair Lance and committee members. The bill before you today is an updated, a better drafted version of the previous bills. In light of recent events, we worked with stakeholders to make sure the bill would be effective and do what we wanted to do, save lives, make our communities safer. It was our intention to address this issue this year as a more comprehensive public safety policy review. A straw purchase occurs when an individual legally purchases an item such as a firearm on behalf of another person who is legally prohibited from purchasing it themselves or who wishes to remain anonymous. While the purchaser may have a clean record and be legally allowed to buy the item, they are essentially acting as a middleman or straw for someone else. In the context of firearms, a typical scenario involves a person with a clean criminal record purchasing a gun from a licensed dealer on behalf of someone who cannot legally obtain one due to factors such as a criminal record, mental illness, or being underage. The true intended recipient of the firearm may have a disqualifying background that would prevent them from passing that required background check. They are common method uh, used by individuals seeking to obtain firearms for illicit purposes, such as committing crimes or acts of violence. The tragic and violent incident in Burnsville is another reminder of why this issue is urgent. The preliminary investigation that led to the indictment states the assailant had lost his gun rights in 2007 after being convicted of a felony assault. There were multiple guns in the home. The weapons were used against the first responders, should not have been in the possession of the assailant. One gun was equipped with a binary trigger that was, as the indictment states, fires one shot when the trigger is pulled and another when the trigger is released, effective, effectively doubling the rate of fire. As we have learned, the use of a trigger essentially creates an automatic weapon which does not allow for any type of defense to be mounted. While straw purchases are already illegal under Minnesota law, our law contains loopholes that need to be closed in order to hold offenders accountable. Our bill, as amended, does the following. Expands current crime to include the transfer of all firearms to an ineligible person, not only the transfer of a pistol or SAMHSA. The amends the uh, mental status required to prove that a crime in included cases where the person making the transfer should have known that the person receiving the firearm was ineligible to receive the firearm. It creates an exception for the transfer of firearms other than a pistol to a minor if that person is ineligible to receive that type of firearm. The bill increases the penalty for a transfer to an ineligible person from a gross misdemeanor to a felony with a maximum sentence of two years and increases the maximum fine for an aggravated violation from 10000 to 20000 The bill also increases the penalty for a transfer to an ineligible person from a gross misdemeanor to a felony with a maximum penalty of five years and a fine of up to $20,000. Under current law, firearms cannot include a trigger activator. A trigger activator can be a device attached to a firearm that allows the rate of fire to increase to that of a machine gun or a device that allows a semi-automatic firearm to shoot more than one shot, either one with a single pull of a trigger or two by harnessing the energy of the firearm to continue firing without additional physical manipulation of the trigger. This bill clarifies that a trigger activator includes a device that allows a semi-automatic firearm to shoot more than one with a single pull and release of the trigger. We have experts from BCS and DPS here to explain technical pieces of the bill if necessary. This bill is one more step we can take in addition to other actions taken by this committee to keep our families and law enforcement safe from gun violence. Gun violence recurs a multifaceted response. This bill closes loopholes in current laws in order to hold offenders accountable. 
Every day, more than 120 people in the United States are killed with guns. Twice as many are shot and wounded, and countless others are impacted by acts of gun violence. Keeping guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them is the goal of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Um, do you have any specific testifiers uh, that you uh, would like to bring forward to testify in connection with this bill? Mr. Chair, I have no testifiers, but again, do have BCA and DPS on standby if needed for technical questions. Uh, if it's all right with you, Mr. Chair, I'd just bring them to the table now. Uh, well, let's, let's see if there are any technical questions that they <laughs> need to come forward for. Uh, we do have uh, signed up uh, uh, Nephi Cole, who was online, um, signed up to testify. Uh, on this bill as well. Mr. Cole, are you still there? I am, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Go My ahead, name is Mr. Nephi Chair. Cole. I'm NEPHI COLE. I'm the Director of Government Relations and State Affairs for the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is the Firearms Trade Association of America. We represent everybody that makes, <laughs> moves, sells firearms, ammunition, and components in the United States of America. I have some significant concerns about this bill. In particular, um, we're concerned about what is meant by the definition of firing uh, without, uh, by, the, by, the, by the trigger components of this bill. Um, if the intention of the sponsor is to, uh, is related to triggers that make a, would, would make a semi-automatic firearm into a fully automatic firearm, we believe those are prohibited by federal law, we're certain they are, and uh, as well as um, likely state laws in the state of Minnesota. The concern that we have is that there are triggers, such as uh, binary triggers, that a single function of the trigger, uh, for example, if you pull the trigger, the gun goes off once. And the same type of trigger, if you operate the trigger in the opposite direction, a single action, the gun goes off a second time. That's two actions of the trigger. It's a pull and a release. Each one is a separate action, and under federal law, that would not be considered illegal or machine gun. Those would be two separate actions under federal law. Our concern is that the way this bill is written, it would make it a, it, a, a significant criminal offense to be in possession of what are already lawful under federal law, and, and, and they're not going to be outlawed under federal law, lawful triggers. And so if that is the case, we have great concerns about um, the purchase of these triggers, the ownership. You're going to have people who are going to come in from out of state who legally own these things. You can buy them legally. They're, they're not restricted. They are common triggers. So our concern is, are, is, does this bill criminalize lawful common triggers in the state of Minnesota and create a very punitive uh, situation for somebody that owns that? We believe that is the case in the bill and would encourage you to revisit that and remove that provision at a minimum. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Cole. Um, I don't have uh, anyone else who's signed up to testify, so let me just ask the room, is there anyone else in the room that wishes to testify in connection with this bill? Um, I see two people. This gentleman hasn't testified yet before, and then Mr. Gosh, but I'm going to ask you to keep your testimony down to two minutes or less. All right, sir, come on forward. Go ahead and identify yourself for the record. Hello, Chair Latz, members of the committee. My name is Jess Pallian. I am the Policy Program Manager at Violence Free Minnesota, the Coalition Against Relationship Abuse. Uh, I'm not really here to support, to testify in support or opposition to this bill, but rather to give a little bit extra context for how coercion occurs in domestic violence relationships and how that can react, I interact with this bill. Uh, coercion in a domestic violence relationship uh, oftentimes does not meet the ways that we think about it in a legal defense uh, scenario. For example, coercion isn't always somebody being threatened directly by their partner, but they might be their children being threatened by their partner. It could be family and loved ones. It could be uh, threats of calling that their employer to sabotage their professional relationships. It could be their pets. It could be any mixture of things that help the uh, abuser maintain power and control over the person who is suffering the harm. Um, and so when you're looking at making law like this, and it is not entirely uncommon that somebody is asked to buy a weapon for their prohibited abuser, uh, in, in the, when they're, essentially when you're making law like this, we just want to make sure that uh, we're keeping on front of mind 
uh, that coercion is an issue that is going to arise if this law passes, um, and that we want to try and get out in front of that to make sure that uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence are being as protected as they can within the, the realm of good law. Um, I want to also thank this committee just for taking gun violence seriously. Every year, Violence Free Minnesota puts out a report on the people who are, we lost in the past year to intimate partner homicide. And every year, the main instrumentality of death for those people who we lost is guns. So uh, I want to just express uh, the concern that coercion can have and, and how we can expand that definition. But I also want to express gratitude for taking this issue seriously. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gosh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Again, my name is Brian Gosh, a uh, lawyer and registered lobbyist of the National Rifle Association. Um, I want to talk about the language here in the bill. Uh, originally, we were neutral on it with the amendment, the language of a single pull and release of the trigger. I want to talk about the common the used pistol called the Glock. Uh, many in law enforcement use it. Um, they, are, uh, they are fixed with uh, automatic uh, reset triggers. You don't need a full release before you can pull that trigger again to fire another round. Um, with this language, uh, it could be problematic and you might potentially be banning the use of a very common firearm in Minnesota. So I just want to throw that out there for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. All right. Any discussion from members of the committee or questions? I'll just say, Mr. Chair. Senator Make a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just say that the, the two bills that we heard, Senator Coleman's and yours, are oddly similar, word for word. Um, and I, I truly think, had we been hearing the same bill, I see there were no spots left on hers, and maybe that's why you originally cloned it. You probably would have had some bipartisan support. But it's really hard for members of the public to follow something that turns into what I would consider some extreme partisanship and hard to follow for the general public where you get these last minute amendments to completely change it. And unfortunately, in its current form, I don't think you have any bipartisan support, which is really unfortunate, because I think this is something we probably could have had some agreement on with folks. You even heard Mr. Ghosh say they would have been neutral. I think you probably would have had a 67 to zero vote on the original bill. So it's really unfortunate that we got to go down this path. Um, I wish Senator Coleman would have been consulted a little bit more. Uh, that's unfortunate as well. I, I, in, this, in this era we're in, everybody's calling for bipartisanship and there's not even a threat of that in here. So I'm just frustrated more than anything and unfortunately I'm going to be completely against the bill now as well. When I initially, uh, I was excited about the opportunity to support the work you two I thought were maybe doing together, but I guess that's not the case. Ms. Mr. Chair? Senator Gustafson. Senator Eichhorn, um, I appreciate your comments. I just want to make sure I understand too, you're saying that you supported this bill until it became a DFL bill and now you are against this bill. Mr. Chair, this is two completely Senator different Senator Eichhorn, bills. The, the, the proper way to, for this committee to work is for you to be recognized by the chair before you make your statement. So, Senator Mr. Eichhorn. Chair. Two completely different bills. Originally, you had the same thing. What you presented us now after your amendments is not even remotely the same. It would have been helpful probably for the general public had you dropped a bill as what all your amendments are. What you, what you have is not the same. Uh, Senator Eichhorn, it seems to me that there's been a lot of work has been done in the last year uh, between, among, between and among all the stakeholders. So uh, it's unfortunate that this is turning into a partisan uh, a, a matter here. It sounds like there's a lot more in common on these bills um, than not. So, and I'll note, I think before Senator Coleman, Senator Pratt had the bill. And before Senator Pratt, I think there were other authors on the DFL side of uh, similar provisions. And I carried the original bill, which was a gross misdemeanor penalty, which is the basis for the law that's being amended now. So there's been a lot of bipartisan work on this over uh, a lot of years. Um, preferable if we could all continue to try to work in a bipartisan manner instead of getting into a, uh, into a uh, partisan battle over this. Um, are there any other discussion on Senate File 5153 as amended? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I was a co-author on Senator Coleman's bill, too, Then that's been sitting in 
passed this committee last year and it's been sitting in finance ever since. And it, if that was the springboard for um, the changes you made, I, I certainly hadn't heard of any of them um, during the last year. So it is a little disappointing because um, th there's a lot of new things in this bill. And so it's hard to kind of go through it and uh, inform opinions on the spot. Um, and they made this A1 amendment, but um, I'll take a look at this and uh, analyze it over time. But it is, it is disappointing. It does seem like there was not uh, bipartisanship on this uh, with the bill pending that we had, um, Senator Coleman and I, um, over the last year. If this was um, something that you wanted to do, you could have reached out to us sometime in the last year, and I'm sure we would have been happy to work with you. But having said that, we'll, um, we'll move forward and, and uh, see what we can come up with. Thanks. It's, sorry. Senator Pappas. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's, I think it's not that uncommon, depending on who's controlling the body, for the authors to switch. I remember a, a collaboration between Senator Eden and Senator Rosen, and when uh, the Republicans were in control of the Senate, then Senator Rosen offer, authored the, um, um, uh, what was it, the drug bill? Um, I'm sorry, forgot the name of the drug, oxycodone bill. Um, and when, when the Democrats had control, Senator Eaton authored it, and they were really worked as a team. So I'm sorry that that didn't work out this year, but it's really not uncommon for that to happen. It's also not that uncommon for DFL bills to have been cloned by GOP members when they became the minority without any contact from the pre with the previous DFL chief author. I can think of that uh, so, um, a little hard to see it worth getting our noses all out of joint over that. But that said, we ought to be able to find common ground. And Senator Kroon, if you need another minute to read the uh, three-page to lead everything amendment uh, plus the A2, we're happy to give you three minutes to do that right now. Otherwise, there will be ample opportunity to, uh, to follow up with Senator Gustafson, who has shown an intent, a uh, very strong willingness to work with uh, stakeholders and interested parties on, on the bill. So is there any uh, further discussion on I, Senate File 5153? Mr. Senator Chair, Gustafson. if I could just add, um, I have invited GOP members to work with me on this. I still invite GOP members to work with me on this. It is something I have brought up to members even before this was dropped. I hope that we can go forward in a bipartisan manner, which was always my intention, including with Senator Coleman, who I immediately offered second author to. So hopefully we will be able to move forward in that regard. Senator Westland, you wish to make the motion here? Senator Westland moves that Senate File 5153 as amended be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion no. prevails. All right, members, we are on to Senate File 606. Lost or stolen firearm, Senator Westland. The packet is being distributed, members. Uh, this is the uh, first committee um, that uh, it is appearing in. Uh, there is a fiscal note accompanying the bill uh, with your packet, and there's correspondence from interested uh, stakeholders and individuals as well for you to review. Senator Westland. <coughs> thank you, you Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Um, I hope you enjoyed your cheesecake. Mm -hmm. So this this bill is regarding lost and stolen firearms. It's very short. Um, it is a very simple bill. Uh, it it does create a duty to report a lost or stolen firearm uh, within 48 hours of the time when the person knew of the loss 
uh, or the, the theft um, or reasonably should have known. It is a minimal penalty. It is a petty misdemeanor. And the bill also provides immunity that if a person does report a lost or stolen firearm in compliance with the requirements of the subdivision uh, one, that they would be immune from criminal prosecution for an offense pursuant to states, state law related to, to storage of firearms. Um, there is a, I believe there is an amendment um, only to change the effective date, uh, Mr. Chair, that the effective date will be changed to August 1st, 2024. Senator Wesley moves that uh, line 1.21, 2023 be deleted, replaced with 2024. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Westman. That is the basis of the um, bill. Uh, I stand for any questions. I don't believe. Is there anyone have. in the room that wishes to testify in connection with this bill? I have uh, Brian Gosh is signed up ahead of time, and Rob Vanasik, who I believe is not with us this afternoon. Mr. Gosh, if you have something to add on this bill specifically, come on forward. To please see if you can. Keep it down to two minutes or less. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Brian Gosh, uh, National Rifle Association, opposing Senate File 606. Um, I believe it's a laudable goal that this bill has, uh, but as a 2018 survey of firearm studies conducted by the Rand Corporation found that there was no uh, there was no demonstration of the producible outcomes of what this goal would be with this bill. Uh, specific, specifically, the think tank noted that we found no qualifying studies showing that the loss or stolen firearm reporting requirement decreased any of the outcomes they investigated, which included officer-involved shootings, mass shootings, suicide, unintentional injuries and deaths, and violent crime. Um, when somebody has their firearm stolen, their primary goal is to figure out who broke in, how they broke in, keep their family safe, um, they deal with law enforcement, they deal with an insurance company, their thoughts aren't on uh, reporting it within 48 hours necessarily. And they may not discover that it was stolen until sometime thereafter. And even when they do, uh, why call law enforcement twice? You need to get the serial number if you don't already have it written down. That might require a few days talking to the department store. And so you, you notify law enforcement once you get that information. Um, and so finally, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, um, if you pass a law like this, you're going to uh, potentially violate a defendant's Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate him or herself. In that, I mean, you have prohibited persons at times. Those could be people who are dishonorably discharged from the military. Uh, they can maybe committed a felon, uh, a felony, and they have possession of a firearm. Um, if you force them under this law to report that they are in possession of a loss or stolen firearm, that they had a firearm stolen from them that they were in possession of, uh, you are incriminating them. They are incriminating themselves by that report. Under Hayes versus the United States, this is a U.S. Supreme Court case, um, determined that because an individual has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, a prohibited person could not be compelled to register a firearm. You know, therefore, prohibited people could not be compelled to comply with any loss or stolen uh, reporting requirement as that would be an admission of that, that that person illegally owned that firearm. Uh, so for those reasons and others, we would oppose this bill. Thank you. Mr. Gosh, could you clarify for me the last couple of lines that you read? Where did the uh, quote from the case end and your commentary begin at the end there? Um, with the registration of a firearm. Yeah. So the quote from the case said they could not be compelled to register the firearm? That's correct, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay, and then after that, you drew the conclusion from that that they could not also be required then to report a lost or stolen. Yes, Mr. I believe that principle would apply. Okay, um, but the holding doesn't directly apply, does it? I'm sorry, it, could you it, say that again? It, the holding itself doesn't say anything about reporting lost or stolen firearms, correct? Uh, that's correct. That particular case dealt with the registration of a firearm. Okay. I just wanted to clarify because you, you just went straight through without identifying the close I'm trying to quote. stand under two minutes. I'm sorry. All right. Well, yeah. okay. Um,
All right, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair. Senator Westland. <clears throat> um, I would note that there are a number of states that have passed mandatory loss and theft reporting laws, including Colorado. Uh, let's see here. Um, Ohio, Rhode Island, Oregon, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, Michigan, Massachusetts, Maryland, et cetera. Um, so th this is a provision that has been adopted by any number of states, and it's somewhat disappointing to me that there are literally no gun violence prevention measures that are acceptable to certain organizations, none. Not straw purchases, we heard about that. Uh, not a simple provision saying that if your gun is lost or stolen, you should report it. I believe the last testifier said that the person would already be dealing with police, which leads me to believe they would already be reporting that. So the, the logic on this is a little lost on me, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this bill actually also creates a, an immunity clause if, that someone could not be charged under the safe storage law if their um, firearm is lost or stolen. We do know that lost and stolen firearms are uh, firearms that often end up um, being used in criminal activity and the, the sooner that the uh, uh, public safety and law enforcement agency knows about this, um, that is helpful information to them. So again, Mr. Chair, I almost called you Mr. President. Oh. Mr. Chair. <laughs> Oh, no, Senator Champion left. Um, I believe this is a this is a fairly simple um, bill. It has a very minimal uh, penalty for failure to to uh, report. And uh, again, I I I'm somewhat surprised, I guess, often by the the level of objection to things that really are somewhat common sense. Any uh, questions or comments from members of the committee? Not seeing any, uh, Senator Westland moves that Senate File 606 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. Ms. As amended. Ms. Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have a question as, I'm just trying to figure out where, what we're trying to address with this bill and who doesn't report do we have any statistics on how many don't get reported now? Because I, I can't imagine a situation where a lawfully owning gun owner would not report their gun stolen. I, I, I can't think of an incidence where that does happen. Can, is there statistics out there that there's a number of gun owners that don't report their lost or missing guns? Senator Westland. Mr. Chair, I, I don't have that information at my fingertips, and I'm glad to hear that most um, uh, responsible gun owners actually do uh, report their guns lost and stolen. We want to ensure that that is uh, something that all gun owners um, abide by going forward in the future. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. I, I, I do believe that, that the only ones that don't report this are the ones that shouldn't have the guns anyway. So in my view of this, it goes after the law-abiding gun owner if he doesn't realize or reasonably should have known that his gun was missing. I mean, I've got guns at multiple locations, not just in my home, and I might not be there for a while. And then when I go there, I may not just check to see if my firearm is there yet. And, and that reasonably should have known piece concerns me that, uh, and yeah, it's a petty misdemeanor and I might get just a ticket, but it just goes another thing that goes after the law abiding folks instead of going after those folks that I think we don't enforce the gun laws that we have on those perpetrators of, of uh, the criminal activity that we currently have. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. I actually, for one, can imagine situations where a lawful gun owner would prefer that the law enforcement agencies not know that they have guns. Uh, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to envision that kind of a situation, but uh, you have more experience than I do with guns, Senator Howe. Um, 
Not seeing any further discussion, the Senator Westland moves that Senate File 606 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are on members. Uh, Senator Westland has another bill while she's there and, and uh, we'll invite. I'm looking for my Senate file. Twenty-seven fifty-nine. What's the number, Senator Westland? Twenty-seven fifty-nine. Twenty-seven fifty-nine before the committee. I do not have one. I'll take one. Hmm? There we are. Thank you. All right, members. This is the original committee of referral. We have a delete everything amendment. In with the packet distributed to you. Senator Westland moves adoption of the author's amendment, the A5. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Westland, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just for everyone's um, understanding, what we've done is we've combined several family law bills that have actually been dropped. A couple of them, I think, it, uh, were dropped last year. One of them was dropped this year. I'm affectionately referring to this as the mini family law omnibus bill. Um, there are a number of provisions here, uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, that are dealing with uh, several topics. The first being uh, parenting time, the second being spousal maintenance, and the third being antenuptial and postnuptial agreements. Um, I do have a testifier here, but just to provide some um, basic background information, I'm going to address the public policy statement first. <laughs> um, and while I, I'm sorry, sure. just to make sure we got our, our uh, housekeeping in order, um, I've just been informed there's also an A6 amendment, which is drafted to the A5 amendment. Um, That's right. So let's go ahead and have you move adoption of the A6 amendment at this time as well. Thank you. I forgot about that, Your, your Honor. Senator Westland so moves. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Amendments adopted. Senator Westland. Thank you. To the public policy statement. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chair and members, uh, I do understand that there is generally a desire not to have a public policy statement um, in legislation. This is an important public policy statement, and it has been part of a um, longer negotiation with um, with other stakeholders uh, in part of preparing this bill. And in essence, it, it is an important public policy statement that I, as the author, would like to keep in the bill. Um, it, it basically states that it's the policy of our state to ensure that each child has frequent and substantial contact with the child's parents, as long as the child's parents have shown the ability to act in the best interests of the child, to ensure that parents and caregivers provide a safe and nurturing environment for each child, and encourage parents to share the rights and duties of raising their child. This framework is really important for us as family law practitioners as well as for judicial officers that as we are um, working within family law and applying these um, statutes to the cases that we see and in particular for the judges that and referees that hear them, that this is the framework through which we would like that work to take place. Um, I. Um, so I'm actually going to have um, my my colleague and friend uh, Samantha Gemberling is is um, a very well respected family law practitioner and she has worked um, with a number of stakeholder organizations on each of these and uh, would like to have her actually provide a, a walkthrough of the bill and then I will also be available to answer any questions. All right, uh, before we go to Ms. Gemberling, just one other, I just caught a typo, Senator Westling. <gasps> Page 11, Article 2, the title, it says anti-nupital instead of nuptial. So Senator Westland moves to correct the spelling on line 11.21 to anti-nuptial. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Amendments adopted. Ms. Gemberling. Aye. Welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your name first and then proceed. Good afternoon. 
Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Samantha Gemberling. I'm going to thank Brian Lake for feeding me cough drops throughout this hearing. I will try to have a voice as long as I can. Boy, the Bar Association is full service, aren't they? Exactly. So I'm going to start with Article 1. Senator Westland has already gone over the uh, public policy statement, but it makes clear that the laws of the state are equally applied to both parents, assuming that they're both fit and properly able to care for the child, and that's at line 1.15. 1.27 to 2.4 ensures that a child, what they've historically experienced with both parents is considered by the court if we were to have a temporary hearing when the parents are no longer able to cooperatively manage their own parenting time issues. Okay. Huh. Senator Westland points out to me my line numbers might be different, so I may just go through the bill, and if anyone needs me to point out where we are, I'm happy to do that. Presently, accelerated or emergency hearings are reserved for eminent emergencies, like a child being abused or removed from the country. Temporary hearings are the other available remedy, but sometimes those hearings can be substantially delayed. This proposed change allows parties to access the courts for an accelerated temporary hearing for temporary orders in two important circumstances. First, when access to financial resources is being denied or withheld, and second, when access to the child is being unreasonably denied. These are common situations and are often used by one party to exercise power and control over the other. Our aim is to allow these, the courts to resolve these high conflict situations rather than letting them fester. The next portion of the bill closes a loophole and allows parties to request attorney's fees in matters that have been previously resolved by the court but require some type of enforcement before a motion is filed when efforts are being made to get the other party to cooperatively comply with the order. This will prevent parties from intentionally delaying proceedings and avoiding any consequence while avoiding their court orders. The bill also adds the children's mental health and safety to the court's evaluation when considering modifications of parenting time under 518.175. These factors consider the impact of conduct on the part of parents that may engage in that's detrimental to the child, but is not quite as obvious as physical abuse. It also allows the court to intervene before a safety risk results in eminent harm. Next, Article 1 clarifies that the current statutory minimum parenting time for a non-custodial parent, which is 25%, is a floor of parenting time, not a ceiling. It's not intended to limit a non-custodial parent's time to 25%. Finally, in Article 1, it strengthens the court's ability to deal with situations where a parent has repeatedly deprived the other parent of time by strengthening and clarifying meaningful remedies beyond the remedies provided by criminal sanction. I would defer to the chair if the chair would like me to proceed past Article 1 and, and go through Exhibit 2 or if we wanted to address questions to Article 1. Yeah, well, I have one question about Article 1 or maybe just a, a point to make on page five of the uh, of the A5 to lead everything amendment in line 21 just want to note it explicitly adds language that says uh, the court must consider the best interests of the child and not uh, use the sole the gender of the parent as the sole basis for making uh, the, that determination um, any members have any questions about article one before we go on to article two not seeing any questions. Uh, and Ms. Gemberling, if, as you're going through it, you don't have to identify page and line number because you might have a different copy, but if you could identify the section yes. that you're referring to, it'll be easier to track. Thank you. Article 2 addresses post-nuptial and anti-nuptial agreements. I'm just going to speak generally to the bill as a whole. The article clears up confusion created by a case in the Minnesota Supreme Court related to prenuptial agreement. This particular article has been reviewed by both the MSBA family law section and the probate section and is also supported by my organization, which is the Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, Minnesota chapter. The case uh, created two different legal standards when a prenuptial agreement is challenged in court. It's made the validity of prenuptial agreements questionable and has caused increased litigation. What we're doing in Article 2 is eliminating confusion and inconsistency by establishing one legal standard that will apply to both marital and non-marital properties in um, these types of agreements. The change will better provide guidance and give parties to prenuptial and antenuptial agreements greater confidence that their agreements will be honored. It will also provide stronger guidance to the court in trying to enforce these valid and important agreements. Thank you. 
And I would move on to Article 3 unless there's any questions on Article 2. Uh, no, please proceed. Thank you. Article 3 addresses spousal maintenance, what used to be known as alimony. The changes in this article are motivated by a frustrating reality that litigants in maintenance cases face very different outcomes depending on which judge they are in front of, even when that may be in the same county. Because the outcomes in terms of amount and duration of maintenance can be so unpredictable, parties struggle to reach their own agreements and are often driven to litigate. This article provides clarity and direction for the courts and the parties with the goal of reducing litigation. We make some technical um, adjustments to the bill, including striking through the phrase appropriate employment, and that is in the first section, grounds. The reason that we strike in uh, appropriate employment is not because appropriate employment wouldn't be considered. It is because we think that the attention of the court is better focused on all relevant circumstances, which can also include employment. So it's not to set aside employment, but it's to avoid disputes about what is appropriate employment for someone who's, for example, been a home owner. Uh, next, we address, <coughs> excuse me, the issues of debt in funding a standard of living. Right now, we are asking the court to analyze the standard of living, and what we've added here is to the extent that that standard of living is funded by debt. Oftentimes, people are living beyond their means, and we want to not set up spousal maintenance expectations based on an unfair standard of living that was funded by debt. The most important part of the bill, um, which it has already been followed by many other states, sets statutory durational guidelines for spousal maintenance. One of the key component issues in spousal maintenance is how long maintenance will be paid, and these durational guidelines are set in place to increase clarity and predictability for parties, which will reduce litigation. It's important to note that these guidelines aren't set in stone, they're rebuttable, so the courts can go outside of them when it's necessary if the guidelines for duration don't fit a specific unique situation. We also changed the uh, definitions of, or the terminology that we use to address and describe spousal maintenance. Currently it's, tran or, excuse me, temporary spousal maintenance, which would be changed to transitional, and permanent, which is changed to and definite to just make it more clear to recipients on what they'll be receiving. Finally, for the first time in Minnesota law, this act comprehensively addresses retirement issues related to maintenance which is an area that desperately needs statutory guidance, and that, I believe, is in Section 7. The new language sets an expectation that both parties are expected to use their assets, including retirement awarded to them in the divorce, for living expenses when they are of sufficient retirement age. This will address and eliminate a lot of litigation about whether parties should be allowed to preserve assets for their heirs rather than using those assets to live. The bill also addresses how retirement should affect requests to modify maintenance. The current statute is silent on this topic, so people approaching retirement age are unclear if they're able to retire and how that will interact with their maintenance obligation. Lastly, the bill provides courts and parties with factors to consider and addresses certain occupations that have mandatory retirement ages, such as air traffic controllers. Collectively, the changes should significantly reduce uncertainty and litigation related to spousal maintenance. And I would be happy to address any questions related to this Article 3. Thank you for that walkthrough. I just want to ask if there's anyone in the audience who wished to testify to the bill. You can come forward. Thank you, and just please begin by stating your name and introducing yourself to the committee. I'm actually testifying in opposition, so is this the correct time to do that? Okay. Yes. 
All right. Thank you, Chair and Committee. My name is Molly K. Olson, founder of the Center for Parental Responsibility. I'm from Stillwater, Minnesota. I'm testifying against this bill. For 25 years, I've been an unpaid citizen, volunteering my time for family law reform in Chapter 518 that would benefit children and parents of divorce and separation. I focus on peer-reviewed social science research and education. I am the one who sends le legislators regularly flyers like this about these issues. The, uh, in the one minute allowed today, all I have time to do is share quick four quick points. Um, throughout one um, collaboration, throughout the last 25 years, I've previously been involved in six collaborative groups with stakeholders. Um, despite this track record of involvement, I haven't heard from these lawyers advocating for this bill for four years. Secondly, I did request a meeting with the chief author. She may not even know this. I did request a meeting at the end of February, but never heard back. Three, I submitted a one-page statement for the record to the committee administrator. I respectfully ask that you take the time to read that, even after this bill inevitably passes. Four, I have a seven-page document that outlines my specific concerns with suggested solutions. Um, it's another sad day for parents and children because after 25 years seeking improvement and no changes on this since 2015, once again the needs and wishes of the divorce lawyer lobby group seem to be putting ahead of affected parents and children. Many amendments are needed to more thoroughly address many long-standing issues in this bill, particularly in the Delete All Amendment on line 8.11. It's way overdue to create a rebuttable presumption of equal or near equal, anywhere 40, 50, maximize, pick whatever you want um, that we can agree on. Um, and to use Senators Westland's previous quote from an earlier bill today, one, there's nothing extreme or radical about a presumption of innocence, basically, and two, our kids can't wait any longer for this. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We did also have a Scott Vogel signed up to testify. If you're here with The us. others that I know of that Ms. we're going Olson. to testify. Uh, excuse me, Chair. Um, the others that I know of that were going to be here were unable to wait this long today. Okay. Well, thank you for your testimony. We'll move to member discussion. Okay. Seeing none. Um, Senator Westland, do you have any final comments before um, we take a motion? I have no additional comments, Madam Chair. And I believe the intention is to send this to the Senate floor, Senator Westland. Pardon me? The intention is to send this to the Senate floor. Sure. Oh, the bill is I, being laid over. Okay, sorry. Never mind. <laughs> Senate file 2759 is laid over. Thank you. And next, uh, Senator Champion, if you want to come forward, Senate file 716. I heard. I was listening. Good afternoon, Senator uh, Mr. Champion. Chair. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And while uh, my testifier is being set up, is it okay if I give some context for the bill? Because I know that time is of the essence. Yes, sir. Uh, before you start, members, the packet is being distributed. Uh, this bill uh, comes to us uh, from Health and Human Services, um, I believe, and there is an amendment um, which is technical in nature, but since it's not an author's amendment, we'll wait until we hear about the bill first, and then we'll address the amendment. Uh, Senator Champion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committees, for the opportunity to talk to you about the Minnesota um, African American Family uh, uh, Preservation Act. The purpose of this bill is to keep African American families in Minnesota intact when they encounter child protection services. This bill intends to address disparities that African American families face in the child protection system or child welfare system, and these disparities 
show in how often African-American families are reported to child protection services and how it is more likely African-American families or children are separated from their caregivers for arbitrary reasons compared to white families. This bill is a responsible uh, response to some of the challenges that have, that have been experienced by African-American families and other disproportionately represented families, children and families. This bill establishes the, uh, as I mentioned before, the Minnesota African-American Family Pre Preservation Act, providing for ch child protection, out-of-home placement, and termination of parental uh, rights processes specific to African-American children and families. This bill also requires uh, case reviews, creates the African-American Child Welfare Oversight Council, and requires the Commissioner of Health of Human Services to establish the African-American Child Wellbeing Unit and establishes grants to provide services and support for African-American children and families involved in the child protection system. Lastly, the bill modifies procedures for petitions for reestablishment of the legal parent and child relationship. That was a bill that I carried some years ago and this bill will modify that in order to shorten that. But this bill also um, requires um, African-American cultural competency training for people working in the child welfare system and appropriates uh, grants or money to administer this act. That's the reason for this particular bill, uh, Mr. Chair. And at the, uh, the appointed time, I will certainly answer any specific questions regarding the bill. But before I turn it over to my testifier, um, as the chair indicated, there is a packet of support letters. And those support letters range from the Association of, of Minnesota Counties to the, uh, to the Association of Resources and Advocacy for Children, Youth, and Families. You'll see a letter from the Council for Minnesotans of, of African Heritage in, Heritage in support. You'll also see in your packet a letter of support uh, from the DFL Feminist Caucus, as well as Evolve Family Services, along with Family Refuge. And also, I think it's important uh, that you also see the uh, Gambanian Association in Minnesota, where they support this bill. But particularly, you will also see in the packet Hennepin County Board of Commissioners, who also su support this bill, along with Immigrant Development Center, um, as well as Institute to Transform Child Protection. And you can see them and others from the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law Child Protection Clinic, Bethel University, uh, as well as Minnesota Institute for uh, Nigerian Development, um, and also the uh, Office of Foster Youth Ombudsperson uh, from Minnesota. They also support, as well as the National Association of Social Workers. So there's a number of support letters. You can see those. And so we will go to my testifier, who is Khalees Houston, who's been a main advocate and supporter of this bill and, and helped craft a, a lot of the language here uh, many years ago. Uh, and so she's going to take some time to uh, uh, put us in the right context. So thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Khalees Houston. Ms. Thanks. Houston, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank, thank you. you. Go thank ahead and state your name for the record and present your testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, Khalees Houston, Executive Director of Village Arms, uh, Chair of the NAACP's Child Protection Committee. I'm also your constituent, so I'm pleased to be uh, before you today. I'm really uh, glad so to have you, you here now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm waiting. I'm going to speed through a presentation that we have. I've provided you all with a copy of it as well as um, a printout of the PowerPoint, so I won't stop on every slide, but I do want to add some context to the issue. Uh, this is a longstanding issue in the state of Minnesota. Uh, 50 plus years ago, um, uh, my elders in the community were fighting the issue of child welfare disproportionality. Our Council on Minnesotans of African Heritage was af actually created as a result of this issue. Um, and each year, what I want to get across is that each year that we fail to act, the disparities increase. So I'll give you all a moment to get settled and um, hopefully the screen. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, just so I can manage our time properly, can you give yes. me some idea of how long your presentation is on the PowerPoint? I'm only going to take about five minutes to run through the data. I really just want to provide some context. One of the major misconceptions about families involved with child protection is that the majority of them are abusive, and that is absolutely not the case, specifically when we're starting to talk about African-American families. We're coming into the system for less serious allegations than our Caucasian peers, but our children remain two to seven times more likely to be removed from home. And although we make up 10% of the total Minnesota child population, we're 30% of those that face a termination of parental rights at the end of our cases. So the systemic racism uh, impacts our community at every decision point of the child protection process, and this bill really targets that. We piloted the bill in Hennepin County. We did a three-year pilot of the, of the bill. We served over 200 families. We closed over 90% of those cases without a child removal by implementing provisions of this bill. So it really does work in practice. It's a common sense bill. Um, thank you. And my PowerPoint is up, so. Go ahead, Ms. Houston, when you're ready. Absolutely. I want you all to note as well, when you're considering uh, race and ethnicity information collected, there's a African American category and a two or more racist category. Over 50% of the children in the two or more racist category have a black parent. So that differentiation really skews the data as to how many of our children, how many of our families are involved with the system and how many of our children are actually displaced. So always pay attention to both of those categories. There's a video that you all were provided via email of our parents' experience with the system, and I'm hoping when you have time, you'll review it. Our families are three times more likely to be reported to child protection. Once the call comes in, if the family is African American, they're 2.4 to 4.7 times more likely to screen that call in. And again, our children are removed two to seven times higher than white children. And according to DHS's data, we're coming into the system for less serious allegations than our Caucasian peers. One of the contributors to this outside of the systemic racism, the institutional racism, is poverty being labeled as neglect. A lot of our families are facing issues related to their socioeconomic status, not any actual abuse against their children. Uh, when we look at DHS's data, 6.9% of the 13, excuse me, 12,312 children that were displaced, only 6% were removed for physical abuse and 3% for sexual abuse. So I think that's important to note that there are absolutely alternatives um, that could keep that family in place and connect the family to the needed resources and supports. And I won't take much more of your time because this, this is decades old data. I'm not telling you anything new. Um, and I want you to be able to ask any questions that you have. Uh, thank you. Senator Champion, do you have any other testifiers uh, in support of your bill that you've arranged for? Uh, Mr. Chair, no. We would only have someone else in the event that you all needed it. But uh, like, for an example, you wanted someone from child protection, or a worker who's actually in child protection and who could add some context, uh, that would only be uh, Ms. Tripp if you needed her. Okay. Then uh, before we go any further, let's... Uh, well, actually, I'll ask in the room. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify in connection with this bill? Not seeing anyone coming forward. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have um, an A24-0256 amendment, which looks to be technical in nature. Um, Ms. Uh, Primo, is that correct? All right, Council's indicating this is a technical Amendment. So Senator Umu Verbaten moves adoption of this amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Um, I understand there may be another amendment coming. Uh, it's not distributed yet, but we'll make sure we get it taken care of before and we And Mr. Chair, the, the other amendment that comes, once it comes, is Senator really Champion. just to take out uh, rulemaking uh, that it, it was something agreed to uh, with state and local governments and so therefore we didn't have to go to state and local government because it takes out the rulemaking gotcha. that's all, and, and that's also consistent with the house when that arrives Senator Champion uh, we will take it up uh, all right so one question that I have Senator Champion is that as a general practice not always adhered to depending on the nature of the bills before us but as a general practice uh, we don't use purpose statements in our statutes. There is one here, which I have read, and it's beautifully written, but uh, my question is what, if you can explain 
uh, if there is a, a necessity for that purpose statement in this particular bill that you're presenting here today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the whole reason for the purpose statement, we just thought it would be important to put it in context as to why this act is necessary and what um, uh, our intent and purposes are. And so that's why we thought it would be important to be there. And it's, uh, it's, it just clearly just articulates the, the purpose of it and it's to protect the, uh, the best interests of African-American children and, um, and dis, disproportionately represented families as well. But that's what is done. And then what are our desired outcomes, which is to improve permanency outcomes, including family re reunification for African-American children. Even though we know under child protection, under Minnesota Statute 260C, reunification is uh, something that that statute already says is our intended purpose, which is to reunify families. <clears throat> so, Senator Champion, I'm seeing really two components to the purpose statement. Um, you know, Justice Thiessen uh, wrote a letter, an article in the uh, recent Bar Association magazine about statutory interpret or about writing statutes, basically, sort of a suggestion for legislators. Um, and among uh, in that article, it did say that sometimes purpose statutes are helpful because they help the courts in uh, interpreting what may be ambiguous statutory language. Um, but as, as a general matter, just sort of a, an explanation of the policy reasons for supporting um, a proposal, we have, we have stripped out purpose statements. Um, so as I'm reading this, you know, we just finished a family law bill where I think it's particularly valuable because of the, the family law history and judicial history be helpful to have that in there. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are. With, with the exception of paragraph B on the top of page two, uh, which is, to me, it's clearly a statement relating to statutory interpretation. Um, the uh, paragraph A, which is all contained on page one, whether you think that's necessary for statutory interpretation purposes, should there be a, a judicial action or whether it's more in the nature of a, uh, a policy advocacy uh, statement that, that we could appropriately delete. You know, Mr. Chair, thank you for that question. I actually do think it's really helpful in order to, uh, in order to make sure that uh, if something comes up before the courts centered around this act, it would help the court um, if there's ambiguity or anything from that vantage point. But that's my thinking, Mr. Chair. Okay, and I will note uh, 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 Ms. Primo also indicated that it might be helpful should there be some kind of an equal protection challenge under the Constitution. So there might be some value there. So I guess I, I will uh, leave it at that uh, uh, and we'll move on forward. So is there any, uh, oh, we do have the amendment now ready. Is it being distributed? Let's, let's do that. Let's, uh, uh, Senator Umover Baton uh, can offer this amendment. It's the A3 amendment. Um, and while that's happening, I think we've already had a description. It strips out the rulemaking provisions. Um, anything else in the amendment, Ms. Uh, uh, Primo? Mr. Chair and members, it removes um, Section 9, that, that's the major substantive change, which um, would have required a um, uh, re-referral to state gov, and then it makes a lot of conforming changes um, related to that. All right, Senator Umo Verbaten moves adoption of the A3 amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Is there any discussion from members of the committee? Questions, comments for Senator Champion or his testifier, Ms. Houston? Not seeing any discussion. So, Senator Champion, where does this go from here? Uh, finance. Like, uh, finance? Yes, Mr. Chair. All right. Senator Umo Verbaten uh, moves that Senate file uh, 716 as amended to be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator. Thank Chamber. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, 
Uh, so our next bill is going to be Senate File 4245, Senator Kumu Verbatim. Members, the bill packet has been distributed uh, to you. It contains an A3 delete everything amendment. This is the first committee stop. So this is an author's amendment. Senator Umu Verbatim moves adoption of the A3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Amendments adopted. Uh, there are also a packet of some uh, letters for the uh, committee members review as well. Senator Umu Verbatim to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate File 4245. Um, this bill aims to collect statewide data on traffic stops by creating a standardized form for law enforcement agencies to use, collect, and maintain accurate records of pretextual stops. They've been the subject of contention due to their disparate impact on marginalized communities. Um, and this bill really aims to gather actual data to inform policymakers, law enforcement, and the community about the occurrences of pretext stops. Law enforcement already collects some of this data, but by creating a standardized collection process, law enforcement entities can use it to uncover whether there are disparate interactions, um, increase inefficiencies, and solve concerns that surface. Um, I want to keep us moving, so I think it would be good to hear from our testifiers on the bill um, before we move to questions. Uh, so I have a, a number of people have signed up to testify. I see two are flanking you at this time. Who would like to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair, and to the committee. My name is Charmin Leone, formerly with the Cleveland Division of Police in Ohio and currently the Director of Law Enforcement Initiatives at the Center for Policing Equity, a research and action organization committed to using data to identify and reduce the causes of racial disparities in public safety. CPE has worked with dozens of law enforcement agencies across the country who seek our assistance to improve their data collection practices because they know that data helps them pinpoint the core issues, driving inequity and assess the effectiveness of their policies and practices. Without statewide standards, law enforcement agencies are left with the burden of determining their own protocols for collecting, analyzing, and disseminating data, which frequently leads to incomplete, I'm sorry, Lisa, or unanalyzable data, as well as making them carry the burden of making their case to local officials for funding the improvement of their technology. Robust statewide data on police interactions can help lawmakers, law enforcement, and communities not only pinpoint the core issues driving inequity and make evidence-based decisions regarding public safety, but helps departments to better embody the trajectory of our profession in intelligence-led policing. Agencies are hard-pressed to be intelligence-led without collecting intelligence. You cannot manage what you don't measure, and the collection of this data is not a huge additional burden for most police departments, as officers already record many data points on stops. Finally, as the officer in charge of recruitment for police, fire, and EMS in the city of Cleveland, today's recruits, I found that today's recruits are more educated and retention of these officers has become difficult as they are looking for meaning and effectiveness in our work. Our ex exit interviews of our younger officers indicate that they often leave due to the ineffective practices we still employ in policing. They are more technologically savvy and understand that the ability to speak and report from an informed position are some of the characteristics of the policing career that they are looking for. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my support for Senate File 4245. Thank you, Ms. Leon. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. And your name, go ahead. Charlotte Reesing. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, I am here today. My name is Charlotte Reesing. I am the Government Affairs Manager at the Center for Policing Equity. I work with Charmin. Um, and I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 4245. I'll make this short. I think Charmin covered a lot. Um, but I'm going to give a little bit of the national uh, perspective and also sort of how this works in practice. Um, so 25 states and D.C. have statewide mandates for data collection for police. Uh, and these include states like Alabama, North Carolina, and Colorado. Um, this is really not a huge change in, or burden for most police departments and most <coughs> officers. Um, as Charmin said, most of these data points are things that are already collected by police officers, um, especially as there's been a move from moderniz modernizing from paper to electronic um, recording. Uh, and in conversations with stakeholders in Connecticut that has a, a similar uh, piece of legislation that was passed a long time ago, um, we have found or we've heard that it's taking officers an average of under 30 seconds to record their data points after stops. So that's really not a huge time commitment for them. Um, and the positive impacts for data collection have been seen across the country and here in Minnesota. Uh, St. Paul uh, Police Department saw racial disparities in their data for certain types of police stops. Uh, they changed their policy and, uh, and practices in order to try and address these disparities. And uh, they tracked all of this with data and saw that this improved their disparities and did not change their firearm seizures. So the data alerted them to the issue that they had, the inequities that they had in this particular type of practice. It enabled them to make these evidence-based decisions about their practices and then allowed them to track their success and the effectiveness of the policy change. Uh, so again, uh, uh, Senate File 4245 uh, ensures the right data will be collected, and that will empower law enforcement agencies, lawmakers, and community to identify racial disparities and make informed decisions about public safety. I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We also have uh, previously signed up uh, Kelly Moore. Is she present? Come on forward, Ms. Moore, and give us your testimony, please. Thank you, Chair Latz and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Moore. I'm the Deputy Director of Legislative Initiatives for the Policing Project, and I'm happy to be here in support of Senate File 4245 today. What this bill aims to do is put data about police stops in the hands of communities, law enforcement leaders, and policymakers. And it's gonna allow all of us to see what's working with law enforcement and what needs recalibration. Data collection has the power to be transformative. Jurisdictions that have started collecting data have um, had a number of positive benefits, including increasing stops of intoxicated drivers, decreasing disparities in racial uh, in rates of uh, stops between black drivers and white drivers, and increasing recovery of contraband. Um, as the previous testifier, Charlotte, mentioned, St. Paul has seen some of these effects, but I want to be clear, it's not just St. Paul that is collecting data right now in Minnesota. Um, most of the large agencies in the states are collecting data contemplated by this bill, and some small agencies in the Twin Cities metro and across the state are also collecting data. Um, Senate File 40, 4245 will bring those benefits that those agencies are already getting to Minnesotans across the state. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Moore. Uh, that's all I have in terms of people who signed up. Is there anyone else here who'd like to testify in connection with this bill? Not seeing anyone come forward. Any questions or discussion from members of the committee? Senator Carls. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Didn't we have uh, a pilot of this before? in the past, and I think we had some cities that refused to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember that, but I remember we, we did have something that went on, and there was a pushback from some of the police departments. Um, I, I, know that, I know that there's been conversations in the past. My recollection is that the city of Minneapolis started to do this kind of data collection. I don't know if it was mandated as a part of a state pilot or just a city initiative of some sort. I also know that there was a great deal of difficulty getting all of the officers to comply with the data collection efforts. Uh, that's all I can recall, Senator Carlson. I don't know if anyone else recalls anything more. 
pays more perhaps closer attention to these details. Ms. Moore, do you have an answer? Thank you, Chair. Um, Senator, at, speaking to what you were saying about Minneapolis, they had um, started collecting this by local policy, and indeed, as you noted, there were efforts or um, challenges with getting full compliance, which is, I think, uh, a reason why state level legislation is really needed because not only does this bill lay out uh, all the things that need to be collected and how this is going to be reported, but it puts some teeth into it so that there are mechanisms to make sure that agencies are complying with their obligations to report data, which uh, is not going to happen if this is happening at a piecemeal level, sort of agency by agency. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just remember that there's been several times that we've had this conversation, and, uh, uh, and I think I was promised that it was going to be in, in a transportation bill back in, uh, I think it was 2021 or 2022, and uh, it didn't appear in that, that uh, bill, and I was kind of disappointed. Um, and I have, just a, as another point, I've talked to my police chief about it, and uh, uh, he was, he made, tried to make me promise that I wouldn't support something like this because it took so much officer time. So I'm, I'm hoping that we only do th something that is going to, you know, not interfere too much with our understaffed police. So that, uh, that's real important. Thank you. Senator Umover Bay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Um, you should all also have copies of the traffic stop report um, in your packets that I think is a good way to visualize these pieces. I also want to um, call back to what Ms. Moore said about the average time being like under 30 seconds. So um, I have reached out to um, to the police association about that, continue to be in conversation with them as well as the Department of Public Safety just to make sure we have um, the right process in this bill and are not um, overburdening either law enforcement in collecting this information or agencies in issuing the report. So definitely um, willing to take any feedback and make changes to the bill as this moves along. Mr. Senator Carlson. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, and Senator, uh, I see that there's uh, uh, some areas where they're not to collect it from the individual that, that has been stopped. Uh, does the person uh, need to identify, for instance, their own historical makeup, makeup, you know, race, you know, any, anything else that may or may not be sensitive to the person being stopped? Ms. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the bill actually specifically uh, calls out that this is not information to be gathered from motorists, so it's going to be based on the officer's perception. This is intentional because one of the things we're trying to get at here is whether there is bias in the system. So um, mental state, race, ethnicity, those sorts of demographics will not be requested from motorists or other people stopped. Um, I, I just wanted to make two notes. One is um, I know sometimes a common refrain from local agencies is we don't have a problem here. Um, and then when data starts, it's all anecdotal up to that point, and then you start collecting data, and lo and behold, yeah, there is a little bit of a problem here. may have escaped the perception, or there may have been some denial in works um, as well. Um, and then there's also the perception that um, there's some value to stopping, to be blunt, people of color <coughs> more frequently than, than Caucasians because they're more likely to find contraband, um, when in fact we know that the use of, of uh, controlled substances is actually higher statewide in the, in the Caucasian community than it is um, in the uh, communities of color, or at least equal. There's no great disparity there. So it tends to end up being a function of enforcement, not a function of use or violations of the law. Uh, so this kind of data collection, I think, would be really, really helpful, not only for statewide analysis, but for individual departments to identify whether they have an issue and to take steps if they do. Uh, to prevent any further problems. Um, I do note that there is a, um, a data that is to be collected and analyzed at the state level. DPS is supposed to uh, publish reports and hold meetings, and the Minnesota Statistical Analysis Center 
under OJP is um, to also uh, analyze reports and there are regulations to be adopted. So one question I have is, is there a fiscal impact of this bill and does this need to go to any other committee before it goes to the floor? Even though, uh, I'm told it should go to the floor. <laughs> or should we lay it over? Uh, Mr. Chair, like? I, I think laying it over would be best at this point. I'm still getting some <coughs> additional feedback on um, just kind of the specifics of the reports from the Department of Public Safety, and I want to make sure they're comfortable with that. Um, I think we have that time and then um, can request. I think the fiscal note request is hopefully in, um, and then we'll see which um, path that would need to go and if there's like a policy only or a finance on the bus. All right, uh, there being uh, apparently no further discussion, Mr. Turner, you're looking at me like you've got something you want to add to the conversation. Mr. You don't, don't feel compelled to do so, but if, if there is something, go ahead. <laughs> oh, just for the record, Mr. Mr. Turner, Turner and members, that a fiscal note request is in and the fiscal note is in process. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Senate file 4245 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. So now, Senator Uma Verbaten, we've got a list of your bills here. Um, I sure and, do. Uh, so we're hoping you can guide us as to what you prefer to have next. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, next. I would like to go to Senate file 3663. 3663 is before us, controlled substances changes, and we're glad you picked that one because staff has already started distributing the packet. All right, let's see. We have, uh, this is your first committee stop on this. Members have a copy of the bill as introduced and the A1 amendment, which appears to change uh, or uh, address effective dates. So this would be in the nature of an author's amendment. Senator Umo Pate moves adoption of the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Umo Verbaten, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill um, proposes several amendments to Minnesota statutes regarding controlled substances, um, crimes, and their penalties. Um, the amendments to possession crimes in the third degree um, include modifying the conditions under which a person is guilty of a controlled sub substance crime in the third degree. Specifically, it increases the threshold to trigger any uh, or to trigger certain third degree controlled substance possession crimes from any amount to more than a residual amount. Um, and this is really because since the passage of our controlled substance modifications last year, there's been some prosecutors who've been able to um, sort of use a loophole um, and use that to charge criminal defendants. These are folks who, with the legislation that we passed last year, um, decriminalizing um, drug paraphernalia, um, you know, we want to make sure are able to um, get the resources and support that they need, especially from local service providers. Um, so really, uh, that was the intention in um, legalizing the possession of residue um, to also better facilitate needle exchange and other breast best practices in criminal justice diversion and public health. My testifiers can also speak to this. Um, there's also a modification to um, controlled substance crime in the fifth degree, again, seeing the more than residual amount language, and then um, amendments to the penalties. Um, the Minnesota Harm Reduction Collaborative um, has been working on this bill. They've reached out to urban and rural sheriff departments when getting feedback. Um, I do want to note that um, one of the sections that was amended was due to some of that feedback, um, specifically about um, peace officers, you know, if practical and available, providing a referral to local service providers. Um, overall, I think these amendments you know, aim to refine and enhance the regulations surrounding controlled substance crimes in Minnesota, provide some better clarity um, and just best practices in supporting and assisting individuals struggling with substance abuse. And I will turn to testifiers. I don't have a name of a testifier signed up, so sir, go ahead and introduce yourself. 
Um, Mr. Chair, if I believe Eddie Krumpetich is on Zoom with us, if we could oh. start there. Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, we can. If you go ahead and uh, state your full name for us and give us your testimony. Yeah, my name is Edward Browning Krumpetich, and I'm a person of lived experience with severe substance use disorder and a history of chaotic homelessness and the current policy lead for the Minnesota Harm Reduction Collaborative. We're the group bringing USF uh, 3663 in concert with um, Senator Baden. In 2023, the collaborative was founded on the premise that individuals with lived experience have a legislative voice. Uh, excuse me. Have a legislative voice. And we organize statewide service members of the harm reduction and substance use community to advocate for protections and access to statewide harm reduction and related services. Last year's First in the Nation bill safeguarded certain service providers with updated protections and immunities, reduced barriers to pharmacy syringe disbursement, and uh, supported by limiting dispensing quotas, acknowledging barriers particularly to rural Minnesota communities like mine in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, which also included uh, distributing of uh, xylazine test strips and fentanyl test strips, which helped Minnesota communities, including law enforcement, know what is in the drug supply, particularly where it was being introduced, while also accepting and permitting the use of drug paraphernalia uh, which contain drug residues. Users like myself have lived in the shadows and last year's bill created accessible referral loops for individuals with small amounts of substances contained in drug paraphernalia. We wanted individuals to feel safe enough to come out to public health services like best practices show and get help. My story mimics the change of what we have seen since. We have seen a reduction in syringe litter. We've seen an increase in syringe return. And we've also seen a transition from injecting drugs to smoking drugs. And this is within one year. While this is not causal, we can make a good assumption that this is uh, directly related to this bill. My story also mimics this change. I went from injecting to smoking substances and found recovery shortly thereafter. This is what we call curbing drug use. Our bill targeted this form of harm reduction. This transition decreases the likelihood of infectious diseases and helps to lower overdose potential. As Senator Rebaten mentioned, 85 out of 87 counties in the state of Minnesota interpreted this pivot to public health appropriately. However, two counties continue to prosecute residue cases um, and outside of the scope of last year's work. We have testified, and I myself have testified on behalf of more than one of these individuals, and this year's bill attempts to expand the literal scope of what is covered under the residues to include things like gem baggies, and to exonerate Mark Pritchard, who left treatment, and I, I, I say this uh, truthfully, left treatment after they determined they'd be prosecuted for a gem baggie, and he's now facing 50 plus months of incarceration after leaving services. Our pivot to public health is working. Last year's bill is helping to lower arrest and refer um, users with residual substances to health systems and not a jail cell. Lower arrests are not impacting record fentanyl busts in the city of Minneapolis that are still taking place in the state. Lower arrests do not impede prosecution and enforcement of federal trafficking. We are on the same team. In fact, we just received an endorsement for this very bill from the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, Sheriff DeWanna Witt, who we have now partnered on this bill and referred, as Senator Bayton said, to the language presented before you in our pivot to public health, which is a first of its kind provision. Sir, I don't want to have to, sir, I don't want to have to cut you off, but we have a lot of bills left and not a lot of time. Could oh, you, you can please? cut me off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your yeah, testimony. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Have a good one. No, thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. Mr. Chair. Senator yeah, Hoover Baton. Yes, and just in the interest of time, I do have Curtis Hanna here, but um, doesn't need to do any additional testimony. We'll just see what questions the committee has. Thank you, Senator Hoover Baton. Uh, uh, members, we did note that uh, in the copying of the bill that was distributed, it was missing page two. Um, but my understanding that is that contains section two of the bill which makes basically an identical change to what you see in section one of the bill, except it's for the fifth degree controlled substance crime instead of the third degree controlled substance crime. Uh, so uh, any questions uh, from members of the committee or discussion? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the first page of the Senate file, uh, line 21, uh, it strikes word any and uses the words more than a residual. What What is that? What Tell me how I quantify more than a residual. Uh, Sir, go ahead. Identify yourself for the record, then answer the question. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Curtis Hanna. Um, Senator Warren Limmer, uh, currently if you have an unusable, unweightable amount, um, that can still be considered any amount or some? 
So the idea here is to specifically say that if you have a, if you have paraphernalia with a residual amount, which is not usable, not weighable, that that is exempted from this crime. Is, Mr. Chair, is there, is there any other way to quantify it by a measurement rather than just a, a description? I can feel this one on Senator Limmer. So Senator Limmer, naturally, Sir, the residual stuff, my apologies. Go ahead. You can answer the question. Yeah, so nationally speaking, we've done our research surrounding this, and if we quantify that, we're going into the grid, and we want to wait for uh, further studies to do, or in order to do that. Nationally, uh, residuous substances is defined as the unweighted amount of a controlled substance. So if an officer, for example, can weigh it, it wouldn't be covered under residuous substances. We, did, we shied away from going to the grid because we didn't want to change anything until further studies were noted. So Senator Limmer Council has, has informed me there isn't a specific definition in statute of residual. Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Could I have Council tell me what the definition of that is? Mr. Backus, can you give us any, said so there is not any statutory definition. Oh, there is not. There oh, is I'm not. sorry, I didn't hear you correctly. I'm sure Mr. Backus can make one up for us, but. <laughs> to, just to be helpful and answer your question. Um, I do have a question about uh, on page three, paragraph C. Uh, it, it, it says a peace officer may refer a person to a local service provider, and if that person requests it, the officer must make the referral. Um, that's just about referrals, right? It doesn't change anything relating to any criminal uh, prosecution or sanction. Is that right? Mr. Chair, that's Senator. correct. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion or questions on uh, the Senate file? Senator Limmer. Uh, one last question. Does uh, any law enforcement uh, organization support this bill, or are they stating there may be difficulty with it? Senator Mover Baden. Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, we do have the support of the Hennepin County Sheriff's um, Department. Um, law enforcement has been consulted on this um, with the uh, Minnesota harm reduction, but that is um, one that Eddie Krumpetich specifically named. And Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Limmer. Does DPS or the Chief's Police Sheriff's Association or MPPOA have a comment on this bill? Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, Senator I'm Lumber. not aware of any official positions. All right, thank you. Any other discussion or questions? <coughs> Senator Uma Verbaten, is it your desire to lay this bill over? Yes, Mr. Chair. Senate file 3663 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. What's the next bill you'd like us to hear, Senator uh, Verbaten? Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to um, uh, we're Nicole guessing might it's 3670, it. is that right? Or do you have something yes, else in there? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. <laughs> Senate file 3670 will be distributed. Uh, members, we have 3670 before us. This is, uh, it started in taxes, it's come to us. It's anticipated it will go back to taxes from here. Senator, move for Baton to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to keep this simple. Senate file 3670 repeals the illegal cannabis con and controlled substance tax, uh, Chapter 297D, and it also removes the criminal penalties for the failure to pay this tax referenced in Chapter 609, which is currently a felony. Um, so that current tax actually requires individuals to pay taxes on illegal cannabis and controlled substances. Um, it was implemented in... Uh, 1987, sort of during the height of the war on drugs, um, prosecutors may have used it as an enforcement tool um, to charge folks with possession and the failure to pay taxes on their drugs, but that's no longer the practice of most prosecutors in this state. Minnesota County Attorneys Association is aware of the bill, is not taking an official position. Um, the Department of Revenue doesn't have an pos official position, and I'll just know that they've collected zero revenue from this tax um, for the 
past several years. It's also a um, bipartisan effort, was included in previous um, uh, House files from, center, uh, from the House the House Republicans in the other body. Um, and I'm also proud to have bipartisan support on the bill before you today and support from um, Americans for Prosperity. Any testifiers in, in uh, connection with this bill? Not seeing any, any questions or comments from members of the committee? Here. Senator Limmer. I, I'm trying to uh, make sure I understand the direction of this legislation. Um, as we were considering the legalization of recreational marijuana, uh, there was a there is a concern about um, illegal product coming into the state at the same time. Um, that may not meet the same health qualifications of legal marijuana, and. Am I to extrapolate that that illegal marijuana, as I described, if it was here illegally, it would not be subject to a taxation? Senator, Umar, if this is passed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Lotz. Um, part of why the current tax refers to illegal cannabis is because of after legalization, just sort of the way that we defined um, legal cannabis. There's still, you could be possessing illegal cannabis if you have a, a certain weight amount, for example, that doesn't fall under the bill that we passed. Um, and again, I would just say that this process is just not really working. Folks are not, they'd have to go to the Department of Revenue and purchase these stamps. I don't know if those stamps are also in members' packets, but I do have a copy here. Um, and it's just not happening. We're not, we're not receiving any revenue on this, and it's not a practice of most uh, prosecutors at this point. So I think to clear things up, um, it would be best to just remove this tax. So no one who is dealing or, or possessing illegal drugs is going to the Department of Revenue to get to pay the taxes on that activity? <laughs> Mr. Chair. That's a big surprise to me. Uh, our test I want to say a few words on this as well. Mr. Hanna. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yeah, since 2014, we have not seen anybody, or the Department of Revenue has not uh, registered any money whatsoever from this tax being paid. Uh, in their annual biannual reports. Um, additionally, in 2014, there was uh, $1,000 worth of tax stamps sold. However, that was to an individual that mistakenly thought that by possessing them, it made it legal for him to actually possess cannabis at that time. Um, he quickly found out that was mistaken by the courts. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Quite honestly, I don't think it was the intent of the le legislation to uh, raise revenue. I think it was more once illegal product was was discovered and found the culprit, uh, they could enhance a penalty on the individual for not paying a tax or filing for a tax. Uh, it was an enhanced penalty. I'm thinking more about cartels that may be following the legal marijuana trade in Minnesota, and they'll come in with an illegal product. It has not been um, analyzed as a healthy product. It could have fentanyl in it. Um, and that uh, I would still think that a taxation element should be included for that kind of a product. So um, yeah, true. I don't think a cartel member is going to go and drop their name in on the revenue department, but um, provided they don't, uh, there could be an enhanced penalty for bringing in an illegal product. And that, that was a major concern of our discussion as we discussed uh, the legalization, recreational legalization of marijuana in the past. Senator Limmer, just to clarify, it's not an enhanced penalty provision here. It's a separate crime altogether to not purchase the tax yeah. down. Any response to Senator Limmer? Um, Mr. Hanna? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, as you mentioned, we already have uh, possession limits for cannabis possession now after cannabis legalization has gone into effect. Um, in public, you can only have two ounces. Uh, if you have 
drastically more than that that you're bringing into the state, you're already going to be penalized with criminal penalties for possession. Um, I don't believe that there's a need in my mind to have a completely separate felony be added to that possession charge. Um, additionally, it's my understanding the initial reason for passing this law in the mid 80s was actually kind of a proto civil asset forfeiture type of uh, deal where you're actually able to get assets from um, someone that you arrest by charging this tax at a higher rate after the conviction actually goes through. And obviously, uh, just as of Wednesday, the committee here is looking to address civil asset forfeiture, uh, which is still on the books. So I, I just think that um, we can just stay with the criminal penalties for possession rather than having this proto civil asset forfeiture law stay on the books. Any further discussion? Uh, Senator Mover Bait moves that Senate File 3670 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Taxes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Umu Verbaten, I understand Senate File 3999 is next. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Excellent. And I am bringing up Director of Office of Justice Programs, Kate Weeks. Um, I think just in the interest of time, we'll let her uh, walk through the bill. Members, the bill copy is being distributed to you. This is the uh, first committee. Um, as well, I don't have any amendments. Oh, wait. There is an amendment coming relating to the effective date. And one other matter, this would be an author's amendment. Senator Uma Verbaten moves adoption of the A-1. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Ms. Weeks, walk us through the bill. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Weeks. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Justice Programs with the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. The proposal in front of you has uh, three components to it. The first one is in response uh, to the new Minnesota Sexual Assault Payment Program that OJP stood up July 1st, 2023. Uh, we now pay, f we are the sole payer of sexual assault medical claims uh, for the state of Minnesota. With that, uh, any victim identifying information is protected private data um, under the Data Practices Act. This proposal also uh, would like to classify the medical data that is submitted on behalf of those claims to also be protected. Uh, we have a similar protection under our Crime Victim Reimbursement Statute for medical information that is submitted to that program. The second piece, uh, we would like to continue to, uh, we keep finding uh, places in our statute uh, that we need to update to make sure that uh, crime vic the crime victim definition is um, the same uh, throughout statutes on behalf of uh, rights that crime victims have. And the third piece is for the Minnesota Crime Victim Reimbursement Program, uh, ensuring that Un well, under current definition, there is a list of items that we consider collateral sources when we're making eligibility determinations and claim determinations. And those are things that we need to take into um, account prior to making a determination. So like workers' comp, health insurance, things like that. What this proposal does is um, not allow us to consider private fundraising gifts uh, items such as GoFundMe before we make those determinations. One, because it's very, very difficult to figure out if those resources actually made it to the victim of the crime or the claimant. So we want to make clear that we do not, con we should not be considering uh, those sources as part of the program. And that is it. Thank you, Ms. Weeks. Anyone else want to testify on this bill? Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Mr. Chair. Senator Umover I do have an amendment. I don't believe we moved that yet. The A1 author's amendment we just adopted. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> it's been a long day. Seeing Thank no you. further discussion, uh, I think this goes to the floor, right? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. That's Chair. Your intent. Sen Senator Umar Verbaten moves that Senate File 3999, as amended, be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Senate File 4735. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair. 
try to keep us going. Um, this bill strengthens the Student Loan Borrowers Bill of Rights, which originally passed in 2021 with bipartisan support. Um, there's a few things that have changed since that law passed that just make it really clear we need to update it. Student loan payments resumed in September, um, whereas when the bill was initially passed, they were paused nationwide. The federal government has also implemented a sweeping new income-driven repayment plan called the SAVE plan. And just since that rollout, we've seen seen um, servicers improperly handle millions of save plan applications. So this bill um, adds a lot of reporting and registration requirements that really fall under commerce's jurisdiction. Um, it um, requires student loan servicers to evaluate borrowers for those repayment plans, strengthens sort of that language around misleading borrowers, but for the Judiciary Committee specifically, it adds a private right of action for borrowers. Um, if there's questions, I'm happy to provide specifics of the ways <laughs> In which those servicers have um, misproperly um, handled a number of applications. Um, I will say that we've had conversation with the National Council of Higher Education Resources, um, Student Loan Servicing Alliance, some of those organizations representing servicers um, have incorporated that feedback into the um, commerce om omnibus, um, but we do need to hear it here in judiciary because of the private right of action. So. Um, we leave questions to that section of the bill. All right, members, section 14 contains the private right of action. Uh, any, uh, do you have any testifiers in connection with this? Anyone in the room want to testify? Members, any questions, comments about the proposed private right of action in section 14 on page 7? Continuing on to page 8. Not seeing any questions and no amendments on this bill. So, Senator Uma Verbaten moves that Senate File 4735 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Commerce. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Senator Uma Verbaten, what is next? Senate File 3222? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Let's move right. to that. Members, this is the first committee. There is an A1 delete everything amendment. Senator Umu Verbaten moves adoption of the author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to try to keep my comments brief um, for the sake of our agenda. But what I will note is that last year in our Judiciary and Public Safety Omnibus, we provided some funding for the Minnesota Justice Research Center to do a preliminary report, which was sent to committee members. Um, and it's really clear that we need more data to understand this issue. It's been um, kind of practically impossible to access the data, even with public records requests. Um, and so this bill is an attempt to sort of solve that issue. I will let the testifiers speak to more of the specifics, but really is to gather more um, data on this issue to better understand it and then make policy uh, proposals. All right, given that we only have 25 minutes uh, left before we hit deadline, uh, see if we can do this in two minutes or less for each testifier, and if there are questions, we can follow up. How's that sound? Who wants to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate all the work you've done today um, and your continued attention as we near the end of the hearing. Um, I'm here to speak in support of Senate File 3222. My name is Anna Hall. I'm the project lead of the Pretrial Best Practices Project at the Minnesota Justice Research Center. I'm a criminal defense attorney, I'm a researcher, and I'm a community member that cares deeply about improving our pretrial system. Last spring, um, as Senator Uma Verbaten said, this legislature tasked the MNJRC with conducting a comprehensive study of Minnesota's pretrial system and recommending policy changes for the legislature's consideration. Our preliminary report, which was submitted to this committee in February, recommends that the legislature create a statewide pretrial data system. Already, we've had encouraging and very positive feedback from experts in Minnesota and across the country who specialize in pretrial data systems. Minnesota's current pretrial data system lacks transparency, which makes it extremely difficult for policymakers like yourselves, criminal justice professionals, and community members to understand and evaluate even the most basic aspects of our pretrial system. 
For example, does Minnesota disproportionately incarcerate black, Native American, and other people of color before trial? Are people held pretrial in Minnesota more likely to plead guilty than those who are released pretrial? And what is the relationship between a person's bail amount and the number of days they spend in jail pretrial? Because we do not have a pretrial data system, we do not have answers to any of those questions that I just listed. We need these answers to improve where we are failing Minnesotans and to uplift where Minnesota is a model for the country. In the course of our research at MNJRC, we consulted data experts across the country, including criminologists, law professors, state court data analysts, and directors of state pretrial programs. Based on those conversations and our review of Minnesota's current pretrial practices, we developed several recommendations that shaped the bill before you. I'm going to encourage you to wrap up, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Members of the committee, Minnesotans deserve to know whether the policies that affect their lives are consistent with values like safety and equity, and as it stands, the system makes it difficult to know whether Minnesota's pretrial policies do that. Um, so I would urge you to um, adopt the recommendations of the MNJRC in Senate File 3222. Thank you. Uh, sir, do you have anything to add? I Just very briefly. Uh, Go ahead and identify yourself, please. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, members of the committee, again, thank you for your diligence. Uh, I am John Reamer. I am a, uh, I've been a public defender for over 25 years. I'm currently head of the public defender office in Ramsey County. I'm going to do one thing for you I do not do for judges, brevity. <laughs> um, it, it basically, uh, you, you put forth a pilot and you can't figure out what's wrong because you don't have data. It's really that simple. Um, I will personal experience working in Ramsey. Uh, we are working on our own bail reform and sitting together. Once you have information, it's amazing what you can talk about and how you can begin to talk about it and not simply rely upon uh, an uh, anecdotes and stories. And quite frankly, as we've sat here all day, uh, it, just in the city of St. Paul, over two dozen people have probably been picked up and locked up and we can't even begin to figure out who they are. Uh, what their data is and who these individuals are. And that's part of why it's important to know who is being picked up and who is being held across the state of Minnesota. And please don't think brevity is not a lack of passion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Uh, members, there's also an A2 amendment that was drafted to the Delete Everything A1 amendment. We're going to treat this as an author's amendment as well. Senator Umover Payton moves its adoption. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Amendments adopted. Any questions from members of the committee or, or discussion? Hmm? Oh, it hasn't been distributed. Yeah, we'll distribute the A2 <laughs> amendment for you to look at after we pass the bill. I'm kidding. <laughs> we'll distribute it. Mr. Chair. Senator Uma Verbeek. I'll just take this time um, while it's being passed out to profusely thank our staff for uh, dealing with us in last minute amendments, preparing everything for us today. I'm very grateful. Nothing worthwhile around here happens without the staff work. Looks like a technical correction, a privacy note for aggregate data, and a clarification of organization, including university. <coughs> Any discussion or questions from members relating to the A2 amendment? Any reason to readopt it? We're all good? Okay, we're all fine. So uh, this bill is going, where is it going? Hmm? Where would you like this to go? Mr. Chair, the Back bill can be Thomas. laid over. Well. Where did it start? All right, it's ours. We'll lay it over. Next bill, Senator Mover Baden. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe we're going to I'm another sorry, member. Senator Mover Baden, we are going to jump to one that does need to go back to Commerce, Senator Seaberger. Senate File 4138. Came to us from Commerce. There's a fiscal note in the packets, and there is a letter from the realtors. Senator Seberger, to your bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate File 4138 allows the Commerce Department to establish a robust regulatory framework, uh, framework safeguarding the interests of Minnesota families and fostering a healthier marketplace. This has three provisions relating to, relating to this committee's jurisdiction. Section six of the bill pertains to the unenforceability of unfair service agreements, the authority of the Attorney General and private right of action for enforcement, and legal remedies available to consumers involved in such agreements. Section two deals with confidentiality provisions outlined in the CSBS Data Security Model Act incorporated into Senate File 4157, First Engrossment, a bill concerning financial institutions policy, which is part of the Commerce Omnibus. And section three, also from SF 4157, which focuses on background checks required for residential mortgage loan originators or servicer licensing. And we have John Kelly from the Department of Commerce that can tell you more. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and members. For the record, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs uh, for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, given the uh, the amount of bills that are still left on the calendar, I'm happy to just answer any questions that members may have. Anyone else want to testify? Any questions from members of the committee or comments? <coughs> Not seeing any. No amendments to this bill. Uh, members, uh, Senator Seberger moves that Senate File 4138 be recommended to pass <laughs> and be re referred to the Senate Commerce Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, I get one. Madam Chair and members, Senate File 4962 changes the name of a board uh, from uh, the Ensuring Police Excellence and Improving Community Relations Council Advisory Council to the Public Safety Advisory Council. That's all it does. And why is that? Um, I think it's because it's actually easier to say, <laughs> and it more clearly uh, reflects its uh, its intent and purpose. Um, and the breadth of the work that it does. No amendments, are there any questions? And Senate Glass, is this going to be a or are you saying? I think this just uh, gets sent to the floor. I move that it be, uh, move the Senate File 4962 be recommended to pass, be sent to the Senate floor. Any other comments? All of all those in favor for the motion to send Senate File 4962 to be passed and sent to the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The bill is sent to the floor. Senator Ratz, you have another bill? I do. Madam Chair, uh, Senate File 3358. Uh, this bill codifies um, the bail bond standards and regulations that were uh, reached um, in a um, in a consent decree, as I recall, is Mr. Kelly still here, by the way, from Commerce? Am I right, Mr. Kelly? This is a consent decree bill. Um, I will tell you, members, uh, it's still a bit of a work in progress. Commerce heard it earlier today. There were some changes that were made. Um, but we need to hear the basic premise here as well uh, so that it can move forward as part of the Commerce Committee's omnibus bill. Um, I'm working with um, uh, stakeholders from the bail bond companies to fine tune language and the Department of Commerce um, on this. It's definitely going to go to conference committees, so there'll be opportunity to, to finish that conversation up. Uh, basically, the, the point is that uh, in 2016, there was a consent decree entered into by all the existing bail bond companies and the Department of <coughs> Commerce uh, to uh, re eliminate abusive practices um, or practices that were harmful to consumers and set common standards among the bail bond companies. Uh, that consent decree only applies to the signatories to it, the existing bail bond companies. 
Um, so it has a force and effect for them, but not to anyone else that comes into the business. Uh, the desire is to create a statute that adopts those standards and that would require any new entrance to that business to also comply with those protections and standards for the industry. So that's where we're going with this. I ask for your support. Um, I forgot to ask on the last bill if there was anyone want, that wanted to testify. Is there anyone that would like to testify on this bill, 3358? Are there any questions? Senator Limmer. Senator Latz, um, there's a number of bail bond operations in the state. Uh, is there a consensus between all players regarding this bill? Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, there is a consensus that the consent degree should be codified. Uh, there is not a consensus yet precisely as to what that codification will look like in terms of statutory language. So we're working on that. Uh, up until a week ago, I thought there was consensus on everything, but it turns out there's been a little bit of a divergence, um, and uh, we're working on resolving that divergence. So, Madam Senator Chair, uh, uh, could I say that the description is a work in progress? Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, yes. All right. Thank you. Senator Latz, is it your intention this bill be laid over so you can do more work on it or laid over for possible inclusion? Uh, Madam Chair, I think we need to send it back to Commerce so that the bill will travel in the Commerce Committee's omnibus bill uh, carried by Senator Klein. I serve on the Commerce Committee okay. and I expect to be involved in this provision as it moves through the rest of the process. Is there anything in particular you wanted us to look at in this bill? Not specifically, no. I think the whole bill. Senator Limmer. Because it's dealing with bail bonds. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Latz. Wait, wait. I'm going to correct that. I'm sorry. Yep. Council is telling me I've overstated my case. Ms. Primo could Ms. perhaps Ms. Clarify. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, it's just subdivision six on page four that has um, a, 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 a civil action piece to it. Um, that's the only reason it's in judiciary that I'm aware of. I could have saved some breath. Subdivision 6 on page 4. Line 12, Madam Chair, uh, has a civil action. Uh, I see it. Okay, Senator Limmer. Uh, Madam Chair, just a question on process. If this bill is laid over to go to Commerce Department or Agent <laughs> Committee, uh, is there a chance that this bill, as well as other bills that we've laid over, will get sent to the floor without coming back to the Judiciary Committee? Uh, Senator Limmer, the, I misspoke. This is not being laid over in this committee. This bill is being referred back to Commerce. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. hear that. I, I, that was my open question. Senator Latz corrected me. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other committee questions or comments? Anything from the audience on um, subdivision six? All right. Then, Senator Latz, you want to make your motion? Move that Senate file 3358 be recommended to pass, be re referred to the Senate Commerce Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Just keep going. Uh, the next bill is Senate file 4961, another Senator Latz bill. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this bill makes some amendments to a statute that we have uh, passed before relating to the Supervised Release Board. That board uh, takes effect July 1st, 2024. This is for folks in the Department of Corrections who are currently serving uh, uh, lengthy sentences and who by the terms of their sentence are entitled to have a review board um, determine whether or not the rest of their sentence ought to be commuted. Um, there have been some technical challenges in, uh, in processing it um, and uh, some changes that need to be uh, made based on the implementation of it by the current uh, uh, Commissioner of Corrections. Um, so we are uh, proposing this to clarify that. I do have some testifiers here. I'd ask you to hear from them. Senator Latch, you have an author's amendment, the A1 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I move the A1 amendment. 
Uh, since it's an author's amendment, we'll just take the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Senator Latz. Um, I ask the committee to hear from my testifiers. Okay. Could you just please introduce, I have this already. Could you just please introduce yourself? It's for you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kate Riggers, and I'm a law student and student attorney at the University of Minnesota Law School Child Advocacy Clinic. Our clinic represents people who were sentenced to life in prison as children, and we have worked over the last decade to help reform Minnesota's juvenile sentencing laws. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 4961, which makes two amendments to the juvenile sentencing laws enacted last session. Both changes are critical to ensuring that the law reflects the author's and the sponsor's intent. As this committee knows, the 2023 Juvenile Sentencing Reform Law fixed a pro provision of Minnesota's Heinous Crimes Act that had been unconstitutional for 11 years, made Minnesota the 28th state to abolish life without parole for children, and created a tiered scheme where youth sentenced to prison are eligible for review by the new supervised release board after 15 years if they have one sentence, 20 years if they have consecutive sentences for harm to more than one victim, and 30 years if they have three or more life sentences. The amendments proposed to Senate File 4961 do two things. First, they add a requirement that the supervised release board reconsider eligible people within three years of denial. This three-year review requirement had been in the bill for years, but was inadvertently removed along the way last session. Currently, there is no time frame at all for rehearing people after denial. Three years is very much in line with other states. For example, Iowa, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Virginia require annual review. Arkansas is every one to two years, and Colorado, Nevada, and West Virginia are every one to three years. Second, Senate File 4961 amends a provision of the law to require the supervised release board to grant or deny release on all of a person's sentences. Currently, the law allows the board to grant or deny on just one sentence, which is not consistent with the 15, 20, and 30 year approach negotiated and adopted by the conference committee last year. The purpose of delaying review for an additional five or 10 years was to account for the greater harm caused by people with consecutive sentences while still acknowledging their reduced culpability and enhanced capacity for rehabilitation as youth. The current language, which allows the board to further delay review for people with consecutive sentences, on top of this negotiated scheme, is inconsistent with the law's objective, the author's intent, and the approach taken by the vast majority of states. Senate File 4961 also ensures that these two amendments would apply, apply retroactively to any decisions already made under the current language of the 2023 law. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify in support of this bill. My clinic professor, Perry Moriarty, who was involved in the passage of the 2023 law, is here with me today and we are happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Riggers. That was very clear, very concise. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Um, did the other witness want to make a statement? I didn't catch your name. Um, my name is Perry Moriarty, and I'm a law professor at the University of Minnesota. And I do not need to make a statement. I'm right. happy to answer questions if there are any. I'm looking for any questions from members of the committee, anyone else in the audience that wishes to testify. Senator Umo Verbate. Not a question, just really appreciate this bill and would love to sign on. <laughs> Me too. All right, then, Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that Senate file 4961 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. Uh, the motion has been made that Senate file 4961 is amended to be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Thank, Thank you very much. Can I have a comment? The next bill is Senate File 4363, Senator Claire Umoverbaden. Madam Chair, um, we will be really quick. This is just a um, fix to the bill that we passed last year. Okay. Um, 
I do have um, Nate Reitz here from Minnesota Hunting Guidelines Commission who can speak to the bill. Um, I will just briefly say that we established a five-year statutory cap on felony probation links with exceptions for several listed offenses, um, but the exception list does not explicitly mention attempts and conspiracies. So that's what's being fixed by this bill. A fix it, Bill. Thank you, Senator. Um, would you like to make some comment? Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Nate Wrights. Uh, yeah, the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission unanimously recommends this bill. Basically, we're concerned that there might have been something lost in translation when the exception list was translated from the Sentencing Guidelines version in 2022 statute in 2023. And as a result, judges won't have the... Basically, if a judge is imposing uh, probation for a, a an attempted homicide or an attempted uh, sex offense, uh, that judge will be limited to five years probation, which was not the uh, commission's intent. Uh huh. Any questions from members of the committee? Anyone else choose to testify? Then Senator Umu Verbaten, make your motion. Uh, I believe. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe this is going to the Senate floor. So. Uh, I'll move that Senate file 4363 be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor, having heard the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion prevails. The bill is passed. And it's title agreed to. <laughs> the next bill before us is Senate file 4852, Senator Westland. <laughs> Senator Westland, you have three minutes. I have less than three minutes because I have other things here. Um, so uh, set a file 4852 um, primarily amends the methods that the BCA can use to verify a person is uh, required to register as a predatory offender. I do have a testifier here who can briefly talk, uh, speak to the bill. Please say your name and you have one minute. Deputy Superintendent Scott Mueller, thank you for having me. This essentially just uh, gives us uh, uh, alternate verification methods uh, along with uh, being able to have somebody else as a proxy um, verify somebody. Are there any questions? Members of the committee? Anyone in the audience want to testify? Senator Westland. Uh, <clears throat> I have nothing more to say. Then make your motion. Okay. I am moving Senate file 4852 to the floor. <laughs> the motion is to move Senate file 4852 to be passed and sent to the floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion prevails. No. Oh. Which, what's the other one? Okay. For, I don't have four, another four, three, Westland one. bill. We need to do 49. We need to get that one on the table. Oh. Five. Okay. <laughs> Senate, Senator Lass, Senate file 4959. Uh, members, this is going to be the uh, omnibus judiciary policy uh, bill vehicle. All we need to do is lay this on the table so it's heard before deadline. I can use it. Sen Senator Wumo for Payton. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this just it does include one of my bills, and I, uh, one of the amendments that we took, I want to make sure is included. Your, your, mic, your mic is not on. Uh, <laughs> we, Sorry, Madam the, Chair. All we need is the shell. Nothing in here on the bill is necessarily going to go anywhere. Just want to move the A1 amendment. Um, then explain the amendment. Um, the amendment incorporates a change that we made to um, Senate file 3669, which is included in this uh, all right. at the recommendation of council. Uh, and uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Senator Latz, your motion. To lay it on the table, Madam Chair. Senator Latz moves that Senate file 4959 be laid on the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Um, members, I think that we're still going to be taking up a few more bills, but they will be considered late bills. Um, can we just have someone explain, though, if we have a bill that's going to be laid over for possible inclusion, that can still happen, can't it? Just if bills are going to the floor, they'll be late bills. <laughs> <laughs> Someone get a picture. Um, Mr. <laughs> Ms. Primo, Mr. Bacchus, could you explain, please? Uh, Mr. Madam Chair, members, uh, 
basically at this point, any bill passed by the committee is going to be considered a late bill. So, it, you know, if, if you lay bills over and uh, cobble together an uh, like a policy bill next week, unless it's the omnibus funding bill, that policy bill will basically be, be a late bill. Okay. All right. So, uh, Senator Westland, Senate oh. File 4431. Okay. So, Senate File 4431, uh, we do have the um, A10 amendment. Uh, it is... A delete everything amendment, but basically this is the PCR modernization and what we are adding back in or putting into the bill is the option to do paper receipts. So otherwise, otherwise Senator Limmer, Senator Carlson, this is the same bill we saw before, but we wanted to have paper receipts available. Um, I believe that the only section here is the data privacy section. Um, and in essence, uh, you will be all happy to know that we will have an online system available to generate electronic receipts for PCRs that will hopefully make this process uh, simpler for um, both those of us who issue such receipts and for those who use them. And the data privacy piece that we're looking at, uh, we are adding uh, into Section 10A.02, um, it just says to the extent necessary to administer the refund uh, that the board may access or use data entered and stored in an electronic reporting system and share that data with the Commissioner of Revenue. The data accessed, used, or maintained by the board is private data. So that is the part that is um, critical to allow the Campaign Finance Board and the um, Department of Revenue to speak to each other, but maintaining um, that data as private. So now that we have all the time in the world, <laughs> I do have a testifier. <laughs> sir, sir, Mr. Singerton is available. Uh, sir, do you have anything you need to add to Senator Westland's comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not. Thank you. All right. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Oh, wow. <laughs> Senator Limmer. Uh, does the Mr. Chair, does the testifier have any anything to say about waiting all day long to not say anything? <laughs> You're out of order, <laughs> Senator Limmer. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or discussion from members of the committee? This is going to the tax committee, okay. um, Senator. Le so we need to adopt. Yeah. Okay. Dang it. So, okay. So members, the, the part of this bill in our jurisdiction. Um, it needs to be adopted as the A-10 amendment. Those data pieces are exactly the same. So what we're basically doing is deleting everything in the bill except for the data pieces. We're putting the data pieces in. That's in our jurisdiction. It's been described. So there's nothing else for us to consider. Uh, you can read the data pieces in the original bill. It's just processing. So uh, Senator Weston moves adoption of the A-10 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails, amendments adopted. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, Senator Westland moves that Senate file 4431 as amended be recommended pass and be sent to the tax, tax committee. committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Best bill of what the day. What else do we have? <laughs> Who? Did we do your Caroon? We are still on time. Senator Caroon. Senator Caroon, you want to fit yours in right now? All right. What's that? Came out to you guys for a Did we do the <coughs> private detective provision? Senate file 4823 will be distributed. Senator Kroon, go ahead and describe it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. This is a, a bill um, that authorizes the Department of Public Safety to use verification systems to identify participants in the TSA uh, registered traveler program. It's in response to changes in federal regulations. Um, it's supported by the Metropolitan <coughs> Airport Commission, Delta Airlines, um, It'll put our state in line with what almost the entire country has already done, but I will let 
my testifier go into further detail on that. With me is uh, Amy Hopshin, who is the Vice President of Public Affairs at CLEAR. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Amy Hopshin. I'm Vice President of Public Affairs at the secure identity company CLEAR. In the interest of time, I'll just say uh, we are supportive of Senate File 4823. It creates a narrow exemption uh, to Minnesota Statutes 171.12. It allows the Department of Public Safety to work with us on something called source corroboration, mm -hmm. which we are now required to do under our new regulatory framework with the Department of Homeland Security and the TSA. All this does is allow consenting Minnesotans to have their biographic information on their driver's licenses confirmed when enrolling in our optional buy-in only registered traveler service at the airport. DPS would not share any data with CLEAR. They would simply confirm that the information on the ID provided voluntarily to us by a Minnesotan member is accurate. As the Senator said, the exemption was drafted in collaboration with DPS and supported by the Metropolitan Airports uh, Commission as well as Delta Airlines. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Members, we refilled the copier with paper and the bills being distributed. Any questions or discussion? Transportation. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Uh, in, the, in the bill description, it talks about authorizing DPS to use verification systems to verify identity in the Transportation Security Administration's Registered Traveler Program. It's a big mouthful. Uh, are there any uh, data practice issues here that come to mind? Is someone from the DPS department that can make comment? Ms. Hobson or Ms. Primo. Any Mr. data Chair. practices issues in invoked here? Mr. Chair and members, this essentially um, provides the necessary authorization so that um, DPS can access that information to then verify the identity um, for that particular program. So the, the data is classified under current law as private, but this gives that small exception to use it. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Chair, uh, just a brief question. Does, does this program or TSA's program, does it, ver does it in use, does it use the use of, of uh, photo identification or uh, um, maybe you could answer the question where I'm going. Mr. Ms. Chair, Hobson. Senator Limmer, yes. Um, so the answer to that is no. Um, there would be no there would be no transfer of photographs or comparing using facial recognition between clear and the Department of Public Safety um, All that this is allowing us to do is for any of our members that live in Minnesota of which there's 405,000 um, That are paying for our services um, That will you know sort of voluntarily give us the driver's license under two two circumstances one when they're enrolling in the program for the first time or when they have to update their identity documents so if your driver's license expires and you have to put a new one on file, um, we're going to do, you know, sort of like a, provide some of like the, the biographical information, so no biometric, but biographical information to the DPS and they will confirm that that identity document is valid, accurate, and on file with them. They don't actually provide us any information, they're just gonna give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, yes, that is accurate. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Cruen moves that Senate File 4823 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Transportation Committee. You're well, raising your eyebrows, Senator. Um, well, if that's... What, what did you think it was supposed to do? Well, I was going to see if uh, it could be uh, laid over inclusion here, but if you think it should go to Transportation, then that's where I would like it to go. That's where it came from. I think that's where it's supposed to go, but Mr. Ines is indicating... That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I, I would be more than happy to have it go back to transportation. Okay, Mr. I think it'll end up being included in their omnibus bill. All right, 
On the motion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. All right. I think we're done. <laughs> and everything was done on time. All right. Uh, members, um, right now, I think we are planning to meet Monday <laughs> because we do have. A lot of greater Minnesota members aren't going to want to drive in, be unsafe for them to drive in. So if we, uh, if we proceed with a hearing, we'll certainly do at least a hybrid so those members can participate virtually, All right. remotely. So we start at 12.30? Expect to start at 12.30. All right, thank you. Any other questions for members on schedule? Thank you all for your hard work today. Appreciate it. We are adjourned. <laughs>